gonna record this way. Hello everyone and welcome officially. Today's Friday, June 19th, uh, 2020. Happy Juneteenth. Um, we're happy to be here. Uh, welcome to uh, the painters that are joining us every week and welcome to the painters that will see this in the future. And um, uh, we wanted to tell you that you made the right investment. So hopefully um, we'll hear from you uh, in, with a beautiful painting. Anyhow, so um, I hope everyone enjoyed the week. Uh, <laughs> we're going, we're living through uh, in, interesting time um, and um, I'm going to explain a little bit the, the genesis of this um, assignment and also um, I want to share some of the images of an artist, a contemporary artist who lives in LA that inspired me to do this and uh, then we're just going to get to it. Um, two hours until 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time we're going to be working on our paintings. We're going to take a break of 10 minutes so we can recuperate, drink, and take a break. Um, and then after that, um, until 2 p.m., uh, we will be doing some uh, critique and commenting and feedback. Uh, feel free to join in anytime or um, leave anytime. Um, so we'll give you the guidelines for the critique later, but basically uh, you don't have to uh, talk or um, present anything or show anything if you don't want to. We have the link of the photo folder, the shared folder. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start sharing uh, the folder right now. Um, basically because I'll be, I'll be as brief as possible, but um, this, uh, is the painting. By the way, um, for those of you who were not here last Friday, there is a way that you can have both screens on your um, on your computer uh, and then hide everyone else uh, who is not showing. So, um, Jen, do you know exactly how it's done? <laughs> yes. So, um, if you go up to the very top of your um, computer in the middle of your screen, you'll have an option to remove all um, non-video participants. So first you wanna do that because that gets rid of like the ghosts that aren't there. And then secondly, um, if you go to gallery view as opposed to speaker view on the top um, right hand corner, then you'll be able to get both uh, the image of Julio and the image of him painting side by side. Is that what you want? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, no, just making sure because I think it just helps a lot to just focus on the two uh, screens if you want to. And then you can also pin one screen if you prefer and you want to have a larger view of what I'm working on. You can also uh, pin, there's an option on the window that you can click on and pin that, uh, that screen. It doesn't affect anyone else. So um, you can pin the screen that you want to on your own end. So no one gets affected by that. So whatever, uh, whatever formula, both screens, one screen. Um, yeah, so. Right. And you can also make a particular screen a little bit bigger if you extend, um, how do I explain this? <laughs> um, if there's if there's two if there's two screens side by side, you can extend which one you oh, want bigger by using really? the little arrow that turns into that like left right arrow, and you can drag it and extend the particular screen that you want bigger. Okay, okay sorry. No, no, Too technical. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things that I love about Zoom. One of my least favorite things is that it has so many options, and it's so complex when you start digging. So, um, I basically learn of options that are very helpful every time. So thanks, Jen, for that, because I had no idea, and I think that's very helpful. So um, anyhow, so this is the painting that I mentioned in the email. Uh, this is a painting by a contemporary artist who uh, lives and works in LA. Her name is uh, Celeste. Celeste Dupois, Dupuis um, Spencer. Uh, so this is basically, um, yeah, how she writes her name. Um, 
I've been following her for a few years now. And um, just a couple of years ago, she uh, basically made it big. She was featured in the Made in LA. And then she was also featured before that in 2017. She was featured in the uh, Whitney Biennial. So um, anyhow, so I just mentioned this because this painting, um, she took a photograph. She works a lot off of photographs and she took this photograph from the aftermath of the Charlottesville, um, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. And then there was another place where they just took down the monument and then it was uh, a very powerful image. And she took the image, it was everywhere. You probably recognize the image and then she painted it. So um, I thought the painting was brilliant and incredible and amazing. And I like the fact that she's a traditional painter, that she's a observational painter, she is figurative. And I also love the fact that she uh, uh, takes some of her work uh, towards the direction of documenting historical events. So this popped in my mind this week that uh, we've been seeing a lot of news about toppled uh, uh, monuments uh, throughout basically half of the world. So I just brought a few images uh, of her work before that and then also after. And I'm going to concentrate on style uh, mostly because not only I like um, what she does, but I also like how she paints. So it's very um, unapologetic. It's not hyper-realistic. It's figurative. But there's something about it that I absolutely love and I feel that it could help uh, all of us um, sort of like have a, not a guideline, but a point of reference in regards of how much detail or how to treat color or how to bring in perspective. Um, I just want to, for example, bring attention to the um, faces of the people that are not super developed, the police men on the very edge, it's totally cropped. So um, I'm focusing on two things. The conceptual aspect is the fact that she loves to record, document uh, historical uh, or moments in history that she finds, she finds relevant. And I think that's one of the things that I enjoy the most about what we do these days um, and, and a healthy way to engage with um, the complete chaos, chaos that's going on. So I just feel like I, it resonates with me and what, with what we do. And at the same time, I like the uh, simplified style. Um, so there's another one um, as well. I don't know if this is from a photo or not, but I just like, um, I like the image, the composition and how rough and uh, it is in regards of the way it's painted. Uh, she doesn't follow any rules or anything like that. So I like that um, sense of power and, 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 and being unapologetic with uh, visual language. There's something that it's inspiring. She doesn't care. It almost has like a, a, a self-taught, um, uh, look so um, and this is a beautiful one she, she works a lot she can say now that she can support herself with painting so basically that's what she do she, that's what she does uh, all the time um, she loves David Park which is a Bay Area a famous Bay Area figurative painter that I um, that I love um, so maybe Jen you can bring a couple of uh, photos or uh, images of his work, uh, David Park uses, uh, right? Don't we love David Park? Uh, obsessed with David Park. <laughs> <laughs> Would love to. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so um, I, I love the fact that she's young and uh, she, ident she identifies herself as a transgender uh, person. Uh, she's, she's young, she's an activist, she's politically involved, and yet uh, she uses uh, somewhat traditional, traditional, not somewhat traditional ways of painting and also uh, finds value in uh, painting styles that are not like contemporary contemporary. So anyhow, um, this is something that I never uh, knew uh, she did. Um, I followed her, but then um, I just stopped following her because uh, she, her work is amazing. But then uh, I think I was following her on Instagram and it was, uh, there was, it was just too much, uh, basically, because I think she goes on tangents a lot. And um, so I just, uh, yeah, uh, anyhow, I stopped following her on Instagram, but I, I do love her work. And I think this is a, another example of documenting something, whether um, uh, uh, as being the witness of something. So obviously um, 
she we've seen this image before um and you know it just uh creates strong emotions but rather than just uh shying away from it uh, she decides to uh, record it and i think there is something um powerful uh and also something that i uh, enjoy um engaging with it's Maybe I would never paint this, but I love that she painted it, and I love the way she's she's painted it. And there's something monstrous about it, and and um, the ominous as well. So I know um, that she brings her political views in a, in her style, basically. But I wanted to bring this in because there's nothing wrong about being witness witnesses of history and using images that we may agree or disagree. Um, but uh, that we find we need to memorialize and in the sense of like uh, make permanent. So that's why uh, we went ahead and decided to do this assignment, even though we realized that it's a very, it's, 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 it's not a pretty subject. Uh, we were wondering how many of you would join, but we're so happy that you did because I think uh, it's important to just uh, explore or discover or entertain or engage um, uh, without being afraid of. So I'm going to try to keep things within the painting, um, uh, you know, theme, I guess. This, this is a picture of her, and she's represented by uh, Marlborough Gallery in New York, which is one of the most prestigious galleries, uh, art galleries in the world. Um, I don't know what she's up to these days, but um, yeah, so... Anyhow, and then what we did, this is my palette. It's a little bit, uh, it's not, I didn't rotate the image, but I'm gonna use the neutrals, uh, the pink and uh, light blue. I brought green because my image has uh, some landscape. Um, and then, yeah, so we, thanks for selecting the images. So we asked people to um, just put your names on the image so we know that, um, the images have been selected and taken. Um, so I'm gonna go over it really quickly since you're here. Uh, and I hope you guys are already starting but I'm, uh, with a sketch because I'm, I understand, acknowledge that I'm taking a little bit too long. But it's important because I wanna make, make clear who has what and then uh, just in case. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've been in the positions before where uh, we offer this um, selection of images and someone, um, ended up painting an image that someone else painted. And uh, even though it's totally fine, uh, anyhow, it's a delicate subject. So Dina, uh, great choice. And by the way, uh, on the image, if you just uh, click the info, uh, well, I guess, yeah. So you can see either on the name of the file uh, or on the info description, you're gonna see the person or the name of the monument and who uh, and where it is. Um, this is a little bit older. It's not recent. It's uh, New Orleans. New Orleans. Um, uh, it was taken out uh, earlier, but anyhow. So yeah, no one. Let me see. Uh, let's just kind of like go this way. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm just gonna go quickly. Uh, Sarah Brochure. I love this image, Sarah. So this is a, a Christopher Columbus sculpture in Boston, and this is recent. So no one took this one, no one took this one, no one took this one. Okay, I'm just going over the images. Um, wait, yes, I need to be a little lower. So Lois, great image as well. I love that. Uh, I think it's uh, Minnesota, Christopher Columbus as well. So uh, Farrell, uh, nice image as well. I think it's Minnesota, uh, also different view. Um, Laura, another Christopher Columbus in Miami. Um, I brought a couple more um, recent because people uh, people change the narrative of the sculptor. I think this is something that we've been discussing uh, this week, um, how um, that there are two themes here that are important, uh, history versus narrative, and how they basically have clashed those two things and they have nothing to do with each other. And I feel, you know, people still uh, are interested in debating, but um, yeah, so we can talk about it later or another time, but yeah, that sense of like history versus narrative. I love this image because it takes history and then turns it into narrative. 
So it's there's my something... hometown. <laughs> yes. Uh... Yay, Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a weird thing to be like, yay, but I'm so happy to see these things come down and finally to for this to be happening. So it's it's a proud moment for a former Richmond, Virginia or <laughs> Right. Yeah, I thought of you a lot because there are a lot of them that are in Richmond, actually, the capital of the, yeah, was the capital. So basically, yeah, you may feel it would be interesting. We can talk about it later, but you may have a lot of uh, feelings about this. This is in Europe. Uh, King Leopold uh, II, uh, it's a pretty hardcore image. I decided to upload it anyhow, but yeah, um, I'm not going to go into the history of each of the individuals because I think it's a waste of time. Uh, Leopold II as well. Um, I think this one is in US. Um, this one is also in US. Uh, Hania, great choice. Um, Denise, great choice as well. Leopold II also. Uh, this one is in Belgium and also very recent. Um, I think it's a powerful image, yeah. So, and um, this is a building. Uh, this used to be a slave market uh, somewhere in the U.S. And they, uh, uh, Fayetteville, sorry, I misspelled it, Fayette, Fayetteville? Yeah, Lafayette, I mean, I think it's Fayetteville. I don't know, maybe I just did it wrong. Um, but yeah, they just, uh, they didn't burn it down, but they tried to. And then this is in Bristol. So Chloe, great choice as well. This, I think this was one of the first ones that we saw from Europe or uh, really early. So, um, anyhow, I love this image as well. I forgot, uh, who it is, but I just love that they use neon pink. <laughs> And this is in Richmond as well. And I just love the fact that they uh, cover the head and again, reconverting history and um, turning it into narrative. For me, that's, that's my approach. I, I just love that uh, the whole uh, aspect of how um, they're not the same. They're not the same. Uh, I chose this one, uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, this is in Boston as well. Darlene, great image, powerful image. Talk about something super strong without the need of showing um, uh, aggression, I guess, or aggression in the sense of uh, signs of vandalism, whatever. I mean, uh, this is like a decapitated Christopher Columbus with uh, <laughs> the American flag behind. Darlene, amazing uh, choice. Um, and then this one is in Richmond. I forgot who this was, but yes. So I'm glad we went over it and I hope you didn't mind me doing this. Um, and then uh, basically, okay, so I'm just gonna um, showcase this. Uh, yeah, so hopefully you can see the view and I'm gonna go ahead and start and um, time sticking. So um, I'm gonna try to focus my instruction or my commentary um, in ways that can help everyone regardless of whatever image you chose. So um, let's basically start with the fact that this is an image, it's a photograph, it's cropped, a uh, completely different story from last week. Uh, we did um, painting from life. Uh, this is easier because it's cropped. So whether you have it printed, if you were lucky or you have it on a screen, uh, just look at the edges of the screen and start um, with our what we call potato shapes and stick figures which in this case will be really um, very broad uh, generalized um, idea of the shapes that are in our uh, image basically so i concentrate always my sketch work uh, on the edges of the format the format is the size and the shape of our uh, painting and the surface is what we're painting on. So I'm using 12 by 16 and what I do is I try to look at the image. I put the image right next to me. I only have one phone, so I need to get it printed, unfortunately, but um, it also, um, it's an advantage because then I can see the edges uh, as well. So I'm sketching. Um, and sketching is all about arranging. There's nothing more satisfying than arranging things on a space. I consider this uh, my uh, particular personal space. 
And what I'm doing is I'm adding one object or line at a time, concentrating on the edges. And why I'm doing that? Because uh, I feel I can use the edges of my format uh, and the edges of the photograph um, to uh, uh, provide uh, anchor points, uh, points of reference, uh, things that I can translate easily. Um, so yeah, uh, anyhow. So I'm already moving things around, but the whole point of arranging is that it's, uh, it's impermanent. Oh, by the way, talking about in. So I know, I don't know if this, uh, uh, this word doesn't exist in the dictionary, but I chose the word unerected as the title of this assignment um, because uh, I just feel there is a um, connection between the patriarchal aspect of uh, building a monument, all these monuments are of dudes, um, and the association with, uh, of the word erection with this kind of like artistic expression. I have no idea uh, of the etymology of the word and when and why it was used in um, uh, relationship with monuments. Um, but I just find it hilarious and I thought it was, uh, it would be a good tongue, tongue in cheek um, to, uh, instead of uh, use words like taking it down or bringing it down um, to use the opposite by um, using the word unerected. Um, yeah, so I, I just mentioned this because I was going to say that um, the, the sketch, the, the fundament of the sketch is that um, it's unpermanent, which means that I'm able to move things around. So things are not permanent when I sketch, and that's the whole point of sketching. Arrangement involves the possibility of moving things around. Let's use that as an opportunity to uh, decide where our elements in the image will land. So um, if, you, um, if you tie up that concept with the fact that we're using charcoal, which erases easily, we have the perfect combination for spending a little bit of time arranging within the area um, the main objects uh, or the main um, visual planes. So depending on what you chose, some of them are clear uh, portraits, some involve landscape. So these are basically the two main themes that I would say are um, within this uh, series. So if it's only a portrait and there is no uh, perspective, then you're good with um, focusing on the facial features and starting with a keystone if you can, uh, remember from last week, if you were doing the mirror, um, uh, it's important to go back um, to those elements. But if you have landscape, then you have to deal with visual planes. Visual planes are invisible or not invisible, organized layers um, that come from uh, or they're, they're ordered from closer to us to uh, further away from us. And each of the layers reveals one object, one feature, one ge ge geographical or uh, element. So when I look at a landscape, I look at elements that are closer to me, I look at elements that are behind and elements that are behind that uh, um, plane. I always bring the analogy of being a set designer and uh, imagining designing the sets for an opera. Um, so, uh, you know, when you design the sets for a stage, you have to think of how to create the illusion of depth by bringing different kinds of curtains that have art or, or illusions of uh, 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 an object on them. So the layering of the curtains um, basically creates the illusion of depth. So this is exactly the same thing, but in the, our format is our stage. And then what we're doing is analyzing what, what comes first and what goes, um, what goes after, basically. So I'm just gonna go with, I think this is a lake. Um, I've been to Boston once like a million years ago, but... Um, for, I don't know, two days or something like that. And one of the stops was um, 
I went to see the house where Bed Davis was born. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, just go figure. I don't know. It, it was not in Boston. It was outside of Boston. <laughs> All right, so I have that, and um, I'm just going to refer to you um, to the paintings of Celeste, and just I'm going to bring back that image a few times because I want to point out how freeing those paintings uh, uh, are in the sense of um, expressing or recording uh, realism, recording realism. They're not interested in detail, and they're not interested in um, orthodox uh, expression of reality, you know, in the sense of, you know, uh, likeness. Have that in mind because I think it's very important. Our paintings don't have to look like anything. They don't have to be correct, whatever that word mean, means. So uh, they don't have to make sense. If someone looks at the painting and they say, what is this? It's not our business to educate them in the sense of, well, you know, can you see this is like the head and that's the hand. That's not, that's not our business. So um, I think that's important uh, because, um, sorry, that came out like very strong. But uh, yeah, it's important because we feel that part of our responsibility as painters is to make sure that things on our painting are recognizable, especially with, um, with figurative painting. Well, you know, it's, that's, that's not our job. It's, it's, it's not our job. Um, I was, um, and uh, Chloe, you'll help me out with this if you can uh, put it in the chat. But I've been watching a few um, uh, documentaries uh, or clips about the uh, British artist Maggie, I forgot her last name, um, a contemporary artist um, that does incredible portraits. So Chloe, if you want to uh, put it on the chat and Jen, if you want to bring a couple of um, her portraits, she made a portrait of Boris Johnson that looks almost like a, a, um, a combination of Boris Johnson and Donald Trump mixed together. And I find the portrait is amazing. And I think it could be a good opportunity to also find out what, how an artist, a contemporary artist who is interested in portraiture um, faces um, history or faces, you know, um, uh, engages with history. It's, it's an incredible portrait. Maggie uh, something, I don't know, I don't wanna, I think it's Maggie. Yeah, uh, it's Maggie Hambling. Chloe yes. and I said it at the same time. <laughs> okay, good, Maggie Thank you, Hambling. Chloe. Yeah, thanks, yeah, yeah, I love her. I love her, I love her. I don't know what her reputation is <laughs> because these days I feel like I have to check uh, the everyone's background, <laughs> believe background, you know. Okay, so I'm I'm countering my first um, issue with arranging. I realized that I made things too low, um, so uh, I'm just gonna be bold and wipe the entire thing off, and then resketch it again. Very important, you know. Don't be afraid to rearrange. Uh, things. This is the time and the place to do it. And that's why charcoal is a, our best ally. Uh, when we redo thing, uh, when we redo something, and I think to do it again, uh, something, I want to say something very important. We don't have to take the same time that we took to do it in the first place. So redoing and painting, um, it's not, um, a replication of uh, the same timeline. It takes less time. So have that in mind because um, every time we're in the middle of something and then we're like, oh my gosh, um, this is wrong. I have to do it again. Uh, and then most of the time we are like, okay, screw this. I'm done with it. I'm not going to do it. Um, because we think that if it took us an hour to get there, it's going to take us another hour to redo it. Um, well, that's not the case. Redoing things in painting takes much less time and the majority of the time it's so worth it because the new work is much more interesting. Um, 
I realize now that I know why I brought up, uh, I brought up uh, um, Maggie's name, because in one of the clips that I watch on YouTube, um, she says um, that, you know, she received a lot of, she receives a lot of criticism for her portraits, a lot of criticism. And, you know, some people think they're controversial and you're going to see why when we show them to you. Um, and yeah, so, but then she says, you know, it's not, a, it's not of my business. When I finish a painting, it's, it's, it's not, whatever, whoever observes the painting and decides the narrative, it's not up to me or yeah, the narrative, I would say, yeah going back to that um i first came across her work because um she was very good friends with um <laughs> i should have my um my names right uh, francis bacon come on francis bacon yes um yeah so i watch a, a documentary of francis bacon and she was talking about him a while ago and I was like oh, who's this person I love her she's really badass uh if I can use that word I really like her all right now, um, so what I'm doing right now it's basically I'm already starting like shading so 11 30 we have time we have time uh we have time to talk and pause and drink something and we're good with time because I would say a few more minutes to consider our arrangement okay so we talk about this every single time watch your edges and the edges of your format time and time again um, I see paintings that uh, have like a flushed um, image right on the edge or you know they feel like we try to squeeze something in Number one, there's nothing wrong about that. Absolutely. As long as we stand behind one artistic decision, no one can argue against it. So that's, let's just put that out. But um, I, I, I surprisingly, I find that, you know, compositionally, there is things that I see on work that I find they're important to reconsider, even before going into color palette, blending edge quality proportions i usually don't use that word very often if you know if you've been um painting with me uh, i don't use that very often but composition composition yes look at your edges um is it really where you want the elements to be um consider the fact that when we paint using our uh, uh painting or drawing hand we tend to block the image on the other side of the paper or the surface rather. And then we start putting more things on the area of the uh, painting surface that it's unobstructed. Have that in mind because we have a tendency of moving things towards that side. And then all of a sudden we remove the hand and then we have so much space, uh, space on, the other, on the other edge, on the other side. So compositionally, look at how much visual path you have around. Let that visual path frame some of the objects. The problem when something gets interrupted right on the edge without even being cropped is that you create a stop, a visual stop, that it's, there's, it's, it's non-optional. So when someone looks at the painting, they will follow the path around if there's a, uh, an empty path. And then they would stop right there. So they would not continue. So you're causing an interruption on the viewer. And then the viewer may just, uh, generally they don't continue or maybe they do. I don't know. I do. It should probably just be, uh, do a study about <laughs> the trajectory of our eyes when we look at a painting. But creating stops on the edges um, really interrupt the flow of, a viewer that tries to look at the different parts of your painting. So if you're doing a portrait, try to give some space. So then the space around it frames the portrait and then uh, it gives much more of a flow and in, in, in regards of like how the portrait is viewed or the element. So this is the time to analyze. This is the time to analyze. And we've had uh, painters, um, 
very experienced um, painters in the webinars um, that, you know, they can whip up an amazing uh, realistic uh, representation, but then they overlook the compositional aspect. And you know what, sometimes depending on what you have, it's too late, you cannot fix it. You have to do a lot of things in the painting structurally. So when is the time to look at the composition? Now, when we sketch. So I think I'm okay. So again, step back, take a break, or take a little bit of a, uh, take a pause, I guess, and see uh, the main elements. I think that's good. I'll probably have to shave this a little bit. Um, I think that's good. I'm not gonna try to make it realistic, and I don't mind if this, and that's why I chose this one, because um, it's so weird. You don't know what this is unless you read the caption. Uh, it's, it's weird to see this. I mean, if we didn't know anything about what happened this week, I wouldn't understand this image. I, I, I wouldn't understand the fact that there's an object submerged underwater. That's why I love uh, this image so much and then there's books because you would there's this there's such serenity in the outdoor space that my first thought would have been oh my gosh they just put a sculpture underwater how cool um when you know the context behind it it's not <laughs> precisely uh, it's cool but it's not you know um aesthetically uh what it was intended to be um Anyhow, yeah, and then there's some books. Uh, I find the story of Christopher Columbus. Um, I love the fact that uh, um, people directed their um, their expression of, or their, they they uh, they articulated their expression of what's going on by uh, using that. Uh, 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 monument uh, as one of the targets you know yeah so even in barcelona you know there's a very famous uh, uh columbus monument that's ridiculously gig gigantic and um now there's again a new dialogue or debate about removing it and you know debates 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 um what's important to understand is that Practically, from the moment that these monuments were erected, there have been people that have demanded <laughs> not to um, use them in a public space, that there were other spaces that were more, pro more appropriate. So, for example, I'm just going to bring it up, but in LA um, in 2018, uh, we had one Christ Christopher Columbus statue, um, and it was taken out. Uh, in November 2018, 2019. Very powerful moment, uh, really beautiful. And now I think, uh, I think it's in storage and that they're gonna feature it somewhere else. So um, I learned that it, this was uh, decade, decades in the making. It's not like all of a sudden right now, people are angry and then, okay, let's just do this. This has been, yeah, this has been, uh, it's okay. Yeah, let's just kind of like uh, go back to the painting. Um, I'll probably have a better chance to not saying something ridiculous if I just focus on what I know best. Um, but yeah. All right, so I'm just doing my darks and I'm trying to also be more, um, Physical, um, be physical with your application of charcoal. Don't try to be super tidy about it. So um, yeah, move your entire arm, not just pivoting things uh, on your wrist or your elbow. Just move literally your entire arm, your shoulders need to move because otherwise things will have a very rigid look. Okay, so I'm ready for the wash, and this is a good time. I think I have 15 minutes right now, or rather 20 minutes until the first hour. 
to basically wash it. Darks to lights, it's the best way to organize our values. Uh, and then I'm gonna uh, inform myself or of where the darks are by using the charcoal. The charcoal, it's at this stage right now, it's not just the tool that we use to arrange. It is the foundation of how the light is articulated on the painting. So what I'm doing right now, I'm not gonna just basically close this chapter and then move to color. I will let the charcoal inform me where the darks are because it's so easy to flip the switch and say, okay, I've done my um, charcoal. So right now I'm just gonna start coloring basically. So always have this um, 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 intention to build on what you already have. Because I feel like there's something about painting that um, we approach in a very fragmented way. Okay, so now I've done this and then we break that uh, sort of like linear work and then we move on to something else and we don't consider what we've done before. Um, I'm asking you to have the mindset of always trying to build on what you already have. There's a reason why we did the charcoal, not just to arrange the composition or to deal with composition, but to also articulate where the values are in our painting. So what I'm gonna do, I'll use the big brush. I'm gonna use, I just uh, basically, um, if you can see, I'm just gonna show you here on this camera, but I'm gonna use four uh, brushes. One that's fairly new, that's big. Uh, and then two medium ones, one nasty, one smooth. <laughs> Um, and then a tiny one uh, that it's uh, not straight, but it's okay. So um, I love punk brushes. So I, I just think that they're the best. Um, and I, I um, um, basically, I feel like I've always, like most of us, you know, we always kind of like root for the underdog um, in everything. Well, also in brushes, I like to root for the guys um, that are in the worst condition. Um, <laughs> this has nothing to do with what I'm gonna do next. So um, two solvents or two liquids, I'm sorry, two liquids. One, it's mineral spirits. The other one is medium combined with a little bit of poppy seed oil and don't get um, frustrated or think that you don't have the exact same formula. Um, you can use gold kit, you can use um, medium if you have it. I would say I prefer to use um, uh, uh, resin based medium uh, because using only oil may make your painting not dry for a very long time and we had this issue we talked about it on Tuesday with Sarah brochure um, which I'm curious about I mean if, I don't know if you order that spray or not but uh, we'll talk about that later but yeah I use a medium gall kit is great but then it dries super fast so if you want to work on this uh, tomorrow or later later yes but tomorrow it'll be all dry so I decided to use a little bit of the medium that I love and a little bit of the puppy seed oil that I got last week because it slows down drying. So I want this painting to be wet. I know 100% sure that I'm not gonna be able to finish this in just the hour and 10 minutes that I have left. So um, anyhow, so those are my two solvents and then I'm just gonna go with the darker notes following uh, or just using my neutrals as an example. It's blue, so uh, the paint's gray. It's perfect for this area because it has a bluish tone. I think on Tuesday, I was thinking I want to talk about uh, uh, blacks and I want to talk about whites. How about that? Because uh, I think that these are the two um, colors in a palette that uh, are so confusing, you know, there are so many whites and so many blacks. And when you think black and white, you only think, you know, well, you know, it must be just one, right? And then people start bringing, um, you know, warm white or cool white or zinc white or titanium white. And then I always 
I'm always confused. Um, well, so that will be one of the things that I'm going to talk about on Tuesday. Uh, the different blacks and the different whites. But yeah, since this is a cool uh, area, so I'm just going to notice what I'm going to do. I just add, I added the blacks. I'm not going to continue with the water. This is what I meant by building on what I have. I'm going to go to the uh, next darks on the sketch, uh, which are the, um, yeah, are the canopies of the trees. And I think in this case, to make a green, I'm going to use a little bit of yellow ochre because I don't want to use green yet. So since the paint's gray, it's cool. And uh, the yellow ochre is a kind of like a version of a neutral version of the yellow. So what I'm going to do instead of like um, bringing green right now, I'm just going to, yeah bring that and then uh, sometimes I use the rag because the rag helps me to carve some light yeah All right, so I think those are my two notes. And then what I'm gonna go is, um, I'm gonna go now to the um, radiant blue. The radiant blue is this sort of like periwinkle-ish uh, light blue that I love so much. We love so much because we use it all the time, basically, um, for everything. It's a good, cool, light color. Um, and not to mention it for landscapes, it's perfect. So I'm just going to wash the whole sky. And so in very technical terms, uh, the stage we're at, we're at right now, it's called staining. And it's the stage that transitions um, from dry to wet, and which function is to seal the pores of our surface and also um, seal the charcoal on the surface. So this is a very, very preliminary uh, transitional state or stage between um, sketching, the final uh, elements of sketching, and also um, previous to painting, really. I mean, we're using a brush, but the, I would consider this very foundational. Oh, I forgot to make dark things on the reflection here. Interesting. So I think I'm just going to go back to that dark uh, that I had. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I forgot the reflection. And then I'm just going to go back. So yeah, um, the idea here is not to, um, this is probably too, there's too much yellow ochre. Doesn't mean like it's going to be permanent, but I just want to make sure that temperature wise it's a little cooler. Oops. So, um, Jen and I were talking before um, uh, the webinar and we were just discussing uh, monuments in LA and um, that we love. And uh, uh, we made a sort of like a short list, but I'll just mention them to you. But if you think of anything, um, just let us know. Uh, well, basically the first one, just because we painted it and it's so LA, uh, it's the David sculpture at the uh, Forest Lawn uh, Cemetery, uh, which was because, you know, it just collapsed overnight uh, a few months ago an exact replica of the Michelangelo in uh, Florence. Um, I don't know, it's such a crazy sculpture. But anyhow, it's not there anymore. Um, I think one of my favorites, um, thinking of that, the context, the historical context, and I may just be now saying something completely wrong um, because I may not have all the uh, narrative or um, to back my choice. 
But uh, there's a very interesting uh, sculpture in all places, in all places, in Beverly Hills, in all places, because Beverly Hills has been the target, uh, is currently the target of uh, the marches and that are going underway, right? Well, the, it's called the Electric Fountain. It's on Santa Monica and um, Wiltshire, the crossing. It's not a very ostentatious uh, sculpture, but there is a fountain with uh, an LA native uh, uh, from the Tonga uh, tribe um, there. I, th I think it was, uh, it was built, I don't know the history of it. It was built in the turn of the century or 1920s. But of all places, of all places, um, it's a neat example of a sculpture <laughs> that no one, um, no one, uh, well, everyone supports, I guess. Uh, it'd be interesting to find out if it, I know that Beverly Hills was uh, tagged and, you know, uh, storefronts were broken and all that stuff. Um, and the sign of Beverly Hills um, was also tagged and, but it would be interesting, maybe Jen, you can find out, it would be interesting to know if that sculpture was vandalized because that sculpture um, is actually absolutely incredible. It's incredible that it's there, but um, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, you would imagine that this would be um, in, uh, never mind. What's the area? Oh my gosh. No, Jen, don't say it because I would feel so embarrassed. Um, anyhow. So, yes. Don't worry. It's not like I'm, I'm like, oh, I know. Over Street. Over Street. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> I can read your mind sometimes, but I was like, I hope he's not waiting for me because I don't know where we're going. <laughs> oh, man. No, no, no. You would think you would imagine, you know, I'm being totally... Um, inappropriate here. You would imagine that that would be there because it's for the simple reason, you guys, that it's one of the oldest places uh, in LA, in the modern LA, I would say, in the modern LA. It, it's where the oldest house in LA is, um, the oldest contemporary house, obviously. Um, but no, in fact, Olvera Street has always been a controversial place for sculptures because there's still one there, uh, King Philip of Spain, uh, King Philip III that's still there, that's still there, and that it's making people really uncomfortable. And it has been moved around, uh, but still there. So um, anyhow, in fact, Sarah Brochure, I'm gonna bring up your name because you have an exquisite, exquisite painting, exquisite painting of that day that we went to uh, Olvera Street and the plaza, and you painted that sculpture, that monument. Um, I love that painting. I love the painting. But yeah, so um, it's been a place of uh, discord, Olvera Street, in regards of monuments. And it still is. It still is. There have been some attempts to um, memorialize uh, the Tonga tribe and the Angelina tribe. Um, there are some flags on the floor. Um, and But um, yeah, it's, it's still a controversial place. Um, well, you know, uh, the fountain is in Beverly Hills. It was a gift. Um, I don't know. In, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if other people protested it, <laughs> meaning the other way around. <laughs> um, people who wouldn't want this um, memorialization uh, in that neighborhood. And, I don't know. I don't know where you guys all live. Maybe I'm just uh, being offensive right now. Yeah, it's we. It's a. It's a. It's a monument that we uh, have on our list of monuments to paint. Um, we also. So yeah, I'm just basically um, adding some lighter notes on my painting and time wise. Yeah, I'd say I'm ready for the next step. But um, I love personally. I love the Rodolfo Valentino bust in one uh, very hidden square uh, or little park in West Hollywood. Uh, I love Rodolfo Valentino and uh, Rudolf uh, Valentino, sorry. I just uh, called him by the Spanish, I guess, name. 
So yeah, there's a bust of him um, in a square in LA, in a park. Um, there's a Beethoven monument uh, in Pershing Square. I have no idea what it's doing there because uh, the music center is basically a little bit north of that and it would have made maybe more sense. But when we went there for a plein air, or one of our very first plein air sessions, uh, we stood right next to the Beethoven uh, a statue. My favorite thing about LA is that our most iconic monuments are really uh, uh, funky monuments, um, like um, Randy's Donuts. Um, it's a very LA monument. <laughs> We painted it, so I think that's one of our, uh, you know, the city monuments, I guess. And then um, we were talking about the muffler guys. The muffler guys are sculptures made out of concrete or cement that were positioned in the rooftops of body shops. Um, and they're some of them are still there. A lot of them are still there. Uh, they're just basically gigantic figures of guys uh, <laughs> looking like robots. Um, yeah, so that's another monument, very LA. And um, another one that I love, it's the Terminix monument of the guy hitting the, trying to hit the rat. Uh, I think it's in Carson. <laughs> to me, to me, I never felt more proud of our LA <laughs> iconography <laughs> than now. Because, um, yeah, there's a lot of things that need to be taken down in the South. Um, and they're doing, you know, they're taking them now by the dozens. But I feel like here, you know, we're okay. <laughs> it's nice to be okay <laughs> in that sense. Um, yeah, I was also shocked about the. Uh, Winston Churchill sculpture in London. So, and yeah, it's interesting to just bring different parts of history and and also bring different narratives. I didn't know uh, much about it. So, yeah. All right, so I think I'm good with that. I just added more blue. But basically, this will be this will be my wash. Yeah, this will be my wash. I think I'm okay with that. And yeah, perfect timing. First hour. If in the first hour you can squeeze in your sketch and your wash um, and a little bit of of the first notes, then it's a good pace. It's a good pace. Now I say this knowing that uh, some of you will take the two hours just for the um, sketch and the wash. And that's probably the right way of doing it. Um, but um, it's important to also mention that um, we, we can achieve something within two hours. And if that's the only time we have, we should achieve something in two hours. So we can just speed up the process by uh, finishing up uh, charcoal and wash before that. Um, if you ask me, uh, I think I would just consider this uh, in progress work after the two hours and continue working if you can. Um, but if you, that's the only time you have, you know, we're gonna be another extra hour after. So when we do the critique, um, I encourage you to also continue painting because that's an hour that you could really take the painting to the next level. Really use to take the painting to the next level. Anyhow, so I'm just gonna go now with a medium brush uh, one of the punk brushes and um, I'm gonna go again from darker to lighter. Uh, repetition is something that happens in the painting process continuously. Um, I repeat over and over again but when I repeat them I don't uh, recoat or redo. I build on what I've done. So the concept of repetition is important but it's important to understand the repetition in a sense of a, a very organic um, building process uh, that doesn't push the reset button every time I repeat something. Because that's, um, that's the habit that we have. Um, 
So I think I need ultramarine blue. So I'm just going to squeeze out of my station. And I'm going to bring uh, ultramarine blue. I feel like I need to make that paints gray a little bit more, a little bit lighter. And I'm also going to use uh, cerulean blue. So we talked about blues a few sessions ago. And uh, based on that conversation, we decided to uh, bring back cerulean blue, which is a great color for sky, for sky and for water, uh, I guess. Yeah. So I'm using the medium right now. I'm only using the mineral spirits to clean. And I need, a, I need to bring a, a little bit of green to that blue, I realize, because it's not, the, the ultramarine blue, it's too cold. It's too cold. So this is when I'm starting to make some color decisions. So um, another thing that I want to say is that painting is drawing. So even though I'm starting to block out some areas, uh, darker areas, here's an opportunity that I take and I use to um, re-sketch, redraw, and bring back any of the edges that I either lost or I feel I feel like I need to um, uh, bring forward, I guess. I'm thinking of the image and um, I'm already thinking of a strategy. I think I'm gonna follow this dramatic um, perspective uh, to bring more detail on the submerge uh, figure and less detail on the background. So I'm already, pre-selecting or prioritizing certain areas of my painting because uh, there's no point in just um, working on one point without any criteria. Julio, can I interrupt you real fast? Yeah. I just have a question that is a little burning. Um, so one of our uh, painters is trying to decide which medium to use and they have linseed oil and golfed. Is it weird to mix the two of them? No, perfect. Great. A little bit of golfed and a little bit of linseed oil. It's a wonderful combination. Awesome. <sighs> yeah. Thank you. Because golfed alone could be too drying. It's it's too much. It's too drying. Um, personally, I mean. Um, I feel bringing a little bit of the linseed oil mixed in, it's so perfect. And I would do half and half, really. I mean, without being specific, I would do half and half. So yeah, since I have so much dark, I'm gonna take the opportunity to uh, bring the dark aspect here. And with a medium brush, I could be a little bit more specific with my brush strokes. Yeah, I just love the darkness. I love the darkness at the bottom. Just It, it just kind of like anchors the painting brings so much weight on that area, so much weight. Um, so it just depends. And, you know, if you guys have crowds, for example, um, you can go back to the folder and see how Celeste um, uh, simplified the figures. Uh, she was interested in the mangled uh, piece of metal, not in the, um, not so much in the concept of in the context or the likeness of the figures. So you can simplify a lot if you have that. Um, there, there have been some very interesting also conversations this week. We talked about um, artists uh, throughout history. You know, there's always this conflict when it comes to recording moments in history. Um, so there's always been this dichotomy that um, it's not possible to reconcile. Um, I don't think it's possible to reconcile between um, the concept of freedom of expression, you know, as artists, uh, 
and the concept of um, censoring uh, things or not censoring things or using a specific narrative, I guess. Um, anyhow, I mentioned this, maybe I should explain that uh, this comes from uh, reading about uh, artists who went to war, uh, first, first World War specifically, um, just to record um, moments uh, and uh, through their art, basically, and not only with uh, photographs and stuff, but also with the sketches and painting. Um, and prior to that, they've been, prior to photography, um, they've been positions in the army where artists were sent to paint the battlegrounds. Um, so I, I thought it was a very interesting um, article in the sense of, you know, always knowing that the artist has, uh, is it a responsibility? Um, knowing that the product, the final product, it's, they won't be able to control it, you know, because most of those paintings were used as propaganda later. So there's this idea of like um, recording a moment in history and being completely free to record um, through your experience or knowing that you have to self-censor certain things perhaps um, out of fear of being used by others uh, with a different narrative. Yeah, it's just a, it's just an an interesting historical uh, perspective um, put forward uh, by historians that documented or uh, described the role of the artist in um, war conflicts before World War One. All right, so I'm just uh, slowly. I'm not nervous. Um, I'm, I'm saying this uh, precisely because I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> it's always like that, you know, you, you enunciate what you really feel. It's very Freudian. But anyhow, so take your time. Uh, I rely on the wisdom of the paint right now. And I know that it will just, uh, it will work out. So our painting doesn't have to have any um, specific look right now. It doesn't have to look like anything. I think I need to start getting some lighter notes here. I need to start getting some lighter notes, mostly for drawing purposes. So I'm gonna bring uh, the blue the light blue and some white and I want to start carving some of the lighter notes um, the reason why I'm using white you would say well you said you were going to do a darker to lighter yes but I just feel like this area needs to have a few more elements drawing elements so I cannot bring forward the drawing elements just working with the darkness that I have I'm using white, which is not a color that I introduce um, so early. So I want to carve, I want to carve some of the edges out of the darkness. I think that's a good idea. All right, so yeah, so um, this is my stage so far, first 10 minutes of the second hour. So I'm gonna concentrate all my work at this time. Let's kind of like have a strategy. So I think my strategy, because I need to be realistic. So what's in play right now, it's basically my anxiety to um, make sure that something's recognizable on the painting. That I just feel like that's part of uh, my emotional process, but I need to take it with a grain of salt meaning like I don't have to, or I'm gonna try not to let that feeling of uh, making the painting look like something uh, overwrite um, the actual process, uh, what needs to happen first before uh, something is recognizable. So it's important to be aware of um, where we're at 
and how uh, what expectations we should have and at, at the same time um, also try to uh, have a strategy for the whatever time that we have left so basically that's my point so in the next 45 minutes or 50 minutes what I'm gonna try to do is half of them maybe until 1230 my time I'm gonna try to develop the bottom side of the painting because I feel like it needs the most work and since it contains all the darker areas so I just feel like it's gonna be important um, and then the other half of the painting I'm gonna split it uh, the first half will be to develop some of the greens and then um, the water and then the sky and then see if I can bring some more details and both so I'm gonna try to uh, dedicate this time or, or have a strategy because I think it's important to look at the clock and um, find out how much time you can allow yourself uh, or you can allocate and then have some time management uh, strategies in place because otherwise you will get really um, completely absorbed with whatever section you're at and then you'll feel your painting time hasn't been productive or enjoyable so to me setting up expectations and a basis of a uh, strategy uh, helps me so um, until 12 30 my time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work on that sculpture right here I'm gonna go back to the darks again because I feel like that's gonna be important so some more darks and um, I'm moving edges around by the way here's the area where our drawing we will realize that it's not what what we thought um, it was when we sketched it uh, we need to move edges around so just be open to that because it's gonna happen and then I'll just bring some darker notes on the books and I'll bring some greens uh, maybe testing the greens uh, the green with cerulean um, blue it's a great combination so I'm just gonna bring that color I'm using the medium. I'm trying to, at this stage, I'm noticing um, if I pick up too much medium, I'm gonna create too many uh, drips. So it's okay, it's okay, but I have to be aware of that because otherwise I'll be frustrated because things are gonna be dripping all the time and I will know why. So, um, I'm applying um, the paint with medium, so there needs to be some fluidity. The medium alone is not, um, it's not gonna do it. But at the same time, I'm aware that if I put too much medium, I'm gonna have some drips that I'm gonna have to deal with. I'm not blending right now. I'm not blending at all. I'm pixelating my strokes. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet so if you find yourself that you're blending uh just be aware that it could be just uh, a red flag because that means that you are more interested in making something look pretty i mean i'm obviously i'm making an assumption so forgive me if that's the case but if that's not the case but yeah to me it would be a red flag i'm just gonna stop there it would be a red flag i'm i'm building um um, collaging brush strokes. I think that would be a good way to um, to describe this. Collaging brush strokes. I'm not blending. Blending is mostly related to detail work uh, for me. Second notes. I'm not there yet. I'm doing first notes right now. Okay, so there's a little bit of darkness right here. Despite the challenge, despite the challenge, I will tell you this, uh, compared to last week, this is much more um, uncomplicated in my, in, in my opinion. Because painting pro from live has its own um, challenge. So know also this, you don't have to, um, you don't have to um, apply all the details that you see. We have to simplify. Simplification is something that 
is important. Okay, so I'm gonna try to bring the darker greens. I'm creating color uh, samples on uh, one area of the palette. Yeah, simplification, simplification. So, um, and also make sure that you understand we're still drawing. We're still drawing. So, I'm 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 sticking with my uh, medium brush, and I'm trust. I have trust. I'm trusting the process. I try not to get overwhelmed. Um, by my time limitation, by the look of the painting. Um, it's not what this is about. But at the same time, I, I acknowledge that this comes up. It, it does come up. So I just have to manage it. I think that's the word. I just have to manage it. And try not to let those emotions basically uh, take over. happens every time we've been here before um yeah so i'm sticking with neutrals neutrals are our friends don't rush to color this will be an amazing piece of work that will um remain or it will uh, memorialize, can we say that? Yeah, memorialize the memorializing <laughs> of this moment in history. Um, people find our paintings inspirational and um, uplifting. Um, they love uh, seeing the work that comes out and it's so tied up with history. Um, there's something really wonderful about uh, looking at reactions or looking, hearing reactions from people and how uplifting um, they think what we do is. All right, so maybe a little bit lighter. So my Advise also, because I'm, I'm realizing right now that I'm spending way too much time in an area that I should probably, should probably move to another area soon. So we feel very, um, very much engaged in one section. It's natural, it's natural, it's natural. But at the same time, we have to be aware that it may just take away from advancing very important parts of the rest of the painting. Flicker in my eyes back and forth. Uh, I talked about uh, how one painter said it's important to spend 80% of your time looking at the looking at the subject and 20% looking at your painting. I think that's a little, you know, <laughs> nonsensical <laughs> because there's no specific ratio. Um, but I do agree that it's good to spend more time on the subject, even though it's not um, intuitively, we feel like it's not gonna, it doesn't make sense. Um, but give it a try when you force yourself to look at the subject a little bit more than you feel comfortable with, you see more, you inform our brain, we inform our brains of more visual information. So it's so ridiculously simple that something that has nothing to do with the color that we make, the medium that we use, but it's so effective in, pro in helping the painting simply by spending more time Look, it's amazing. 
I'm doing it right now. And it's amazing how much I can discover. Yes, yes. Savor your little victories. Don't wait for the end to appreciate some um, small micro moments of joy of uh, in this uh, process. It, it, it's so unfair to kind of like um, just wait until the very end to reap any um, positive feelings about the painting. I'm I I I'm enjoying my little victory. I just made like some books right there, and they're submerged in water. It's, it's only like four inches, three inches, but it's wonderful and makes me happy. The rest of the painting is a mess, and it, I'm so far behind. But enjoy your little victories. Um, yeah. Okay, so th that's the problem. You know, we have a little victory and then all of a sudden we think like, you know, we just gonna, we wanna take it further and further. And then the rest of the painting is like completely uh, abandoned. So no, I'm just gonna leave those books and then move on to um, the rest of the sculpture because I was just gonna go there and then start carving and sculpting and creating more of that, uh, enjoyment but uh, there's other things that need to happen in the painting before that and that's the beauty of painting it's just um, you know just saying uh, it's an opportunity to understand how we function <laughs> so I'm gonna go to um, the other side of the painting because I feel like that's too connected to the books and I feel like I'm doing this because the books are closed and that's gonna make the books look better. So it's, the, it's not the right approach for me. I need to move to an area that's completely underdeveloped, that I'm terrified about, that is so far behind, because that's gonna make the books even better than just the, the, the area around, around it. So let's do it. I'm just gonna uh, draw, because now that I have the books, I can just take that as an anchor point of the rest of the painting and make some horizontal alignments. And this needs to be slightly, yeah, slightly uh, trimmed. I'm shaving certain areas and amplifying other areas. Yeah. All right, let's do the armpit. It's armpit time, and I have five minutes for the armpit. <laughs> I, it's okay. It's okay. I can do it. Flicker in your eyes back and forth. Make your eyes work. You know, sometimes, you know, we think we're seeing, but we're not really making them work because our brain is not backing up that, that function of seeing. So seeing involves looking and thinking at the same time. It's an explosive um, combination. It's not just uh, gazing, I guess. I don't know, I'm just mixing a bunch of words. And... But yeah, I try, to, I, I try to visualize my brain fully engaged with my eyes because I need to extract as much information as I can uh, from what I see. And if I don't have my brain fully engaged, I won't um, extract any information. My eyes will just kind of like go over. So yeah, this is why if someone asks, we know this already, this is why painting, it's so, um, takes so much. I take so much energy. It's just, you know, we're sitting down, we're standing up, but we're fully engaged. Fully engaged. I'm 
I'm just gonna bring some greens, I guess. Squeezing my eyes a little bit because I need to um, find out where the values are. Sometimes uh, squeezing or squinting, I'm sorry, my eyes helps me with that. I also trust uh, the painting process, the wisdom of the painting or the paint, because I know every tiny brush stroke counts. Um, we feel, I feel like we, um, uh, brush strokes are underrated, you know, we feel like we have to add a lot of paint and cover a lot in order to make an effect. Well, I don't think that is accurate. Every tiny brush stroke makes an effect and counts. In fact, I would say that's to me the biggest reason why I hesitate for someone who is not super familiar with painting to throw a palette knife and then uh, tell them to use it. Because I feel like that's not helping um, understand that the amount of paint um, um, counts. And, and sometimes I think it's better to come from a place of very little to create an effect and then move forward to uh, use more paint if you want to, than the other way around. Just kind of use a palette knife and then start applying paint because it gives you the idea that you need a lot to create an effect. I think... I, I, I'm, I'm, I have a, a tiny bit of allergy to palette knives because of it. Because I know that brush strokes are small and um, invisible as they are, they are magic. They can really uh, turn a painting around with very little. So again, I'm not against, uh, I'm not against them. But I feel um, if you're um, if you're not familiar with the painting process, I wouldn't throw a knife, a palette knife, at the very beginning. I think palette knife work is to be reserved for someone who understands all the issues that we talk about right now, and feels that they want to try something different, or they have a big surface, and you know, even for big surfaces, I'd rather use a big. Uh, white brush rather than the palette knife. Okay, so I'm just kind of like moving forward um, and getting um, distracted, but yeah, so right now it's 12.30. Uh, yeah, 12.30. And this is getting recorded, right? Yeah, it's getting recorded. <laughs> one, one day it will happen. So I'm just uh, uh, announcing this as a disclaimer we will finish the webinar and nothing will be recorded. I'm just telling you right now that it will happen. So, okay, so I said that the first half an hour, I'm, I'm just gonna work on that area. Okay, I need a little bit more time <laughs> because I'm just uh, sculpting, I'm literally sculpting that section. And this green is too bright. This green is too bright. I need a little bit of ecru. Yeah, because ecru has a little bit of a, it has too much yellow. This green has too much yellow. And just uh, to tone it down, I'm bringing a little bit of, I was gonna use like red, um, like the burnt sienna. I need to, I need to work on that. Okay, let me just uh, shave the edges from outside. And I still have like dry patches. So let's just do one thing at a time. Let's just kind of like go over the dry patches on the painting. And then we'll just move to second notes. All right.
Okay, so I just kind of like closed the gaps and I brought more details right here. So um, my next, um, gosh, I think, I think, um, yeah, I'm gonna stick to my strategy. I think it's the best way, uh, it's the best way to move forward because otherwise I find myself um, just not taking advantage of the time that I have allocated for the painting. So my, my emotional being would want to go further uh, painting um, the details of the sculpture. Same thing with the books. I feel like I achieved something. I was able to build on what I already had and I wanna continue that feeling. I wanna continue feeling good about this. So that's why I'm inclined to work on that area. But then I have the rest of the painting that needs to be taken care of. So painting um, is an opportunity to understand uh, those mechanisms and then to be strong enough and courageous enough. And it requires courage, trust me, to pull yourself away from something that's giving you a certain level of satisfaction or accomplishment and then move somewhere else that it's complete desert territory and you know you don't want to go there. So um, that, that, that's something that requires courage. So I'm just going to pull away from this area knowing that I don't feel like pulling away because I want to do more, but I do need to take care of uh, that section. To prove my point is that right now, from what I said that, you know, I wanted to do the books and continue, but I knew that doing this would help. To prove the point, I feel like what I've done helps the entire area. So even though I wasn't feeling like it, I trusted that strategy. And I knew that by working somewhere else, even though I just didn't want to, um, I benefited the entire section. So this area right now feels a little bit more, and you can see in the, in the uh, camera or you can see the visual reference. It's just helping. Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm, that, you'll see that, that that's why I was so happy about this because it's getting like very similar. But guess what? So I'm just gonna stop right here and then I'm just gonna do the trees. I feel like, you know, the water has so many beautiful elements, the sky, but darker to lighter. Trust the process and be um, courageous enough to pull away from a state of mind that you feel like you want to be in, and um, but it's not gonna uh, contribute to the benefit of the rest of the painting. It doesn't make any sense. I'm still using the medium brush. I feel like what I need to do possibly, I need to actually start with a lighter tones because I need to carve lighter or darker. Yeah, lighter tones. I need to carve even a little bit of white. I'm gonna use. I'm gonna draw the edges of the trees. They're now simple potato shapes. But I just need to bring the shape a little bit. Yeah. So I will I will dedicate 15 minutes to for this. And right now I just feel like this is I'm already happy I'm doing this because I know that this was the right thing to do, even though I just didn't want to do it. I'm putting too much medium, it's gonna drip. So I need to make sure that I manage um, the amount of medium. If the paint drips, it's possibly, you know, because we're adding way too much medium. And this is much smaller. This building is much smaller. So I'm just gonna reduce it. There's a rhythm also that I appreciate right now on the trees. Uh, they're larger right on this short and they rhythmically, they thin as they go away. Um, so I love that aspect. So I'm just gonna make sure that that rhythm gets captured. And I don't have to be specific. This is, um, this is a visual plane that it's further away from the viewer. So I don't have to be as specific as when I did the books and the folds of the statue or anything like that. So every visual plane in a landscape needs its own identity. So not every single one has to be uh, done exactly the same because otherwise what we will end up having is something super flat. So I know that um, this needs to be taken care of, but I don't have to bring the same amount of detail. So now that I have this, I'm gonna try to bring a green using 
the lighter green yeah possibly a little bit more of the dark because i don't want the green to on the shadows of the trees and i'm doing the darks right now medium a tad of medium uh, with the medium um if you put if you if you put the entire brush in the cup the, the brush is going to get too loaded with medium so just basically pick it up from the tips because otherwise uh, if you yeah if you sink that brush inside of the liquid or the medium it's just going to pick up too much too much medium and then it's just going to start dripping all right so right now it's uh, i'm working in in a very as as if i were blindfolded a little bit just because it, it feels like it's disconnected with the bottom part of the painting but i know it's the right thing to do because it will help the entirety of the painting sometimes you have to trust your strategy and not just be um moving by feeling i mean i know that that's hard to say but yeah All right, so a little lighter green. I'm not gonna go to the super light green, but a little lighter. Nah, that's too much green. So I'm gonna bring some um, Ecru and a little bit of the burnt sienna to pull it down, to pull it back. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah, yeah, time-wise I'm okay, so. I'm pixelating. Um, yeah, pixelating. I'm not blending uh, anything yet. Flickering my eyes back and forth, making sure that I spend time actually looking, watching uh if my colors become way too saturated so i tone them down because i put it if i put a green here that it's too bright it's just going to come forward and then it's going to take center stage and i'm gonna lose the control of the orchestration of the painting because i want this to be the center stage i want this to be the context of the subject so color is a way to bring uh, a spotlight on an object um, and depending on what criteria we use if we bring color on something that it's not under the spotlight that we want then we lose control of uh, the orchestration uh, basically In fact, I would say even this, um, using color in a more of an or arbitrary, arbitrary way speaks more of the ego of the artist rather than the thought process behind the painting. Maybe I, I take it back, I take it back. I think that's a little bit too harsh. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just trying to say that sometimes uh, prioritizing color and not criteria uh, speaks more of uh, uh, about the artist than the actual painting. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but my point is that sometimes um, we can see if there's been a thought process behind the painting because there's a criteria that um, there's a criteria behind it that um, oversees or supersedes, I'm sorry. Um, so this is gonna sound ridiculous, but Jen, can you just give me a couple of synonyms of uh, the word, the verb uh, trump? Because I, I, I wanna make sure that, you know, um, I use other words. <laughs> Super C. Then, I was gonna say overrides. Overrides. Um, what else? Let me 
Let me get you <laughs> some ones. <laughs> I know, it's the worst. I think there's, because that word is everywhere, I feel like people have been incorporating that word in their colloquial vocabulary. Totally. It just because comes it, to mind. Yeah. It's, it's easy and right. it means everything, you know, when you want to say something, it's better or than other things. So, okay, there so is, I have, what? oh, go ahead. No, there's a political intent in using a different vocabulary. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so outshine, outclass, upstage. Oh, this is ridiculous when you think no, about it. Upstage is a good one. <laughs> I like it. And it kind of like goes with a the theatrical um, vocabulary that, you know, staging. Exactly. Upstaging. Yeah, upstage. It's a great word, upstaging. Great Another word. one is put in the shade. Put in eclipse, the shade. Surpass. Eclipse. 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 Yeah. That's a good one. Outdo, outperform, outperform. beat. <laughs> eat yeah that's a good one okay um, good thanks yeah mm -hmm. yeah perfect good words um, i have to say so i googled trump synonyms and within that google search it's people also ask what's another name for donuts so i don't know how, i know like how do they connect <laughs> but it's also hilarious it's oh so funny <laughs> Hilarious. All right, so I just added some um, medium tones. I did darks, I did medium tones, and I, I'm gonna try to bring some luminescent, um, luminescent um, green, a little bit more, a little bit more pale. A green that um, upstages the rest of the greens. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. It's not super colorful, but it's lighter in value. So that that does it. Um, I needed three different values at least for the trees to kind of like not only bring um, uh, uh, illusion of a shape, but also bring the illusion of being outdoors and being um, projected with sunlight. So I think that kind of like works time-wise. Yeah, well, 12.45, I have 15 minutes, but I'm going to just do a little bit of like this uh, tree work because I think that's important. And I have to stop myself because I noticed that I used the lighter green and I started uh, decorating rather than just being strategic. And that's something that's really important. Sometimes um, I feel like I get the color that I want and I'm super happy because um, it, it came up, but then I just put it everywhere. And um, there's a distinction between um, ornating and being thoughtful or strategic because it's not all over the place. You know, the area that I see that has most of the lighter green is this one. Uh, and then I'm, I'm taking over, I'm, I'm dragging it or expanding it towards the other area and it doesn't have, it doesn't have it because, you know, the lake or the pond or whatever, it's round. So those trees don't get the same light. Just going to make a very simple tower here. For now. Yeah, I think that's okay. All right, so I'm good. I'm just going to bring some of the sand. Again, I, what I'm doing right now, I'm trusting my strategy because I would be very happy working on this area right here, right? I would be very happy spending the rest of my time. But I think it's also important to understand that um, I need to have a criteria. I, I mean, I call it structure, but I know that the word structure has sort of like negative connotations when it comes to artistic expression because it almost feels uh, the opposite of it, the opposite of it. But for me, uh, structure means... Um, management it means 
uh, plan. It means um, having an idea. Um, it, it's not about being specific, but it means having an idea. So I find that um, I get more results when I set up this sort of like structure or strategy or whatever you want to call it, and I stick with it rather than just uh, relying 100% on intuition. So I feel like art or uh, artistic expression, everything's left um, to the intuition. And I don't think that's right. Or accurate, not right, accurate. All right, so I'm going to bring, um, I think I'm going to work on the water a little bit. Just bring some lighter notes. Um, my brush stroke is nervous um, and vibrating. Just want to make sure that it's not drawing too much. And I'm bringing some lighter notes in these areas. This is a large surface, so I don't know if I'm going to have that much time. Let me just bring some reflection because I feel like, you know, let's stick to the program and the program is darker to lighter. So I'm trying to avoid because I, I, I got tired of painting the trees and now I feel like, you know, I, I want to just go to a different um, toy, but I have to, um, I have to be realistic. It's going to give me more, um, results if I basically stick to um, a criteria throughout the painting. So it's always like that. It's always about, um, I talked about um, a, a freedom of expression and censorship uh, applied to a specific article that I read. But I feel like um, I wanna uh, pivot those two concepts um, to uh, our process here because there is uh, this management between uh, being free and um, and also uh, being under a structure or regarding a structure what do you censor on your painting because what I did basically here was to censor in a way what I was doing and then uh, went somewhere else how do you feel about it? Um, so yeah, I think that's important. I'm still using the medium brush. I'm not gonna, I think I'm gonna stick with it because I think I'm gonna stick with it. So a little bit of green. So reflection is uh, different, obviously, underwater. So I'm trying to make the brush strokes a little looser. Yeah, well, slowly, slowly. We're never, we never um, move backwards in painting. I always uh, mention this. We never move backwards. There are no setbacks. We don't ruin anything. These are all things that we were, we heard. And then we thought, you know, because we heard someone say it, uh, we should just tell ourselves as well. And it's just a matter of deciding that that doesn't apply to you. And that's what I've decided, you know, in my practice. And I truly believe that this is a cumulative process. We make decisions. We build on what we have. Um, we use a criteria and we use a strategy and we try to uh, be honest with expectations, but it's a, it's a forward moving process. It's a forward moving process. Sometimes we may do things that take us to a different place that doesn't fit what we thought uh, or the expectation that we had. And then we can, we have always the opportunity to redirect our work and go somewhere else, but it's never, and I think that's something I, I strongly believe about that. It's never about doing something that ruins the entirety of the work. It's so, I feel like it's so strong when we do that, when we put a few brush strokes and then all of a sudden we're like, okay, this is just, yeah, that's it. You know, it's, 
I wouldn't know how to um, rewire our brains in that sense, in the, in the moving forward um, premise, but I think it's important to always feel like you are um, building and things are forming and they're always evolving. And there's something about that that feels like positive rather than just ruining or um, making it wrong or making a mistake or yeah yeah that, it's a very it's a spell i call it a spell i mean the word ruin you know i've ruined it how many times have we heard that um it's very powerful it's it's and it's very easy i think it's very easy to give up and say okay all right so i'm just gonna uh bring some midtones in the water i think that's gonna be because i have like all this darkness and then i have all this uh really dry space so I've built a little bit of, um, I think that helps in the sense of creates the idea of, um, it creates the idea of landscape, but I need to build uh, more uh, medium values on the water. And I'm using the cerulean blue. So in regards of painting water, you know, because we always kind of like think, okay, so how do you paint water? So it just depends, obviously, but um, most of the time, water is the reflection of the light above it. So um, in this case, in my case, it's like that. So painting water, it's really painting the reflection of the sky. So whatever light there is in the sky, whatever uh, clouds or whatever tone or whatever value, most likely, unless it's a different kind of water, but most likely that will be the palette that you will use on the water. So the, painting water is not about using a specific blue or having a formula. It's understanding that what we're painting is the surface and the reflective, surf, the reflective surface depends on whatever light we have basically above. So um, yeah, because when, when I say, okay, cerulean is great for water, um, or sky mostly and water, I say this because, um, you know, it's a color that goes great with the sky. I just made some blue, but the paint was way too thick and I had to use and way too light. So I'm cleaning my brush. I need to bring more cerulean blue, but yeah, so then there's all this lightness. So I feel like that's something. Oh, that's uh, going fast. That's going fast. So I'm just going to see if I can just build some. I uh, have five minutes on my end, on my end. And you guys, I know that uh, you will be a different, uh, there's something beautiful in this water right here, a different stages. So don't feel like you have to have it at a specific stage. I just want to uh, show how. I can structure or um, strategize my process, but I'm just bringing some of the light blue right here. And I love the reflection of the sun. So there's pure white right here, no medium. I'm just gonna add it. Clean my brush and maybe just uh, pinch the edges. There's some gray and blue. Yeah, so um, sometimes I, I talk about how important it is to 
you know, bring more lighter, bring lighter colors. I still think it's important. Never mind. Yeah, I was going to say something different. But yeah, um, if you have just a few minutes, uh, bringing pale tones, it's a good idea. Um, we're working darker to lighter. So bringing lighter notes, um, it's a good idea uh, at this stage. some dark areas of the sky right here but obviously this is just far from being um, developed but it's okay yeah I'm actually happy about my process so I just feel I recognize the areas that I have to work on right now um, and I will, because you know, the thing about um, working off of a photograph, it's easier to apply work after your session, because when you paint from live, uh, it's much more difficult, because uh, you know, the light changes and you have to basically paint when the light is approximately the same as when you started painting it. So it's, it's harder to continue a painting that's painted from live. But with a photograph, I can actually um, work on this at any time. So that's a great benefit. I'm just gonna bring some darker notes right here. So many, uh, one of the things that I also love about this uh, process is that I have so much more appreciation for the photograph right now. So much that I see that I want to do. It makes me really excited about what I want to do with it. I also love the symbology of this image. And this is something conceptual. It's the fact that, you know, um, Columbus, was heralded as this incredible, you know, uh, world traveler that crossed the oceans for the first time or whatever. Um, and I like the fact that he is underwater. <laughs> so I feel like that's the, the best uh, representation of today's uh, time. For the best treatment, I guess. All right, so it's one. So I think I, I, I my next step would be uh, to bring uh, the clouds. So, but I think I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna pause the recording, and we'll reconvene if you. Uh, guys want where we can be in, in uh, 10 minutes all right so we can just kind of like talk about uh, you, the work that you've done upload your images if you have any questions or comments or concerns or uh, things that you want to ask when you upload your image of the photo you can actually put a comment uh, as well so then uh, it, it will give us some context uh, for that uh, okay so see you guys in 10 minutes can wait all right. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So we're recording again and um, yeah, I'll just refresh. My gosh, the work looks amazing. Um, you guys are incredible. I'm oh, perfect. Yeah. Gorgeous. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Let me just uh, kind of like bring this image. I'm going to pause uh, for one second um, because I want to make sure that um, I put the, um, the paintings in order a little bit because I think that helps a lot. Uh, I see there is a sketch. So hold on one second. It takes me a little bit of time. I mean, the paintings are incredible. <laughs> you guys did an incredible job. Um, and then the last one, uh, let me see if I can find Darlene's. Yeah, so I'm just going to bring uh, this really quickly and then we'll just go over we'll go over feedback and you have any questions just uh, Jen you let me know but then we'll go over feedback basically as soon as possible there is one question okay 
Okay, let me see. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, so, okay, yeah, so, it, oh, wow. It, can you hear me, Jen? Yes, I'm okay. actually adding one more. <laughs> okay, that's okay, yeah, because I'm gonna, um, just, yeah, you can keep adding and then um, let's work with what we have. And then let me see, I just wanna make sure, oh, perfect, wonderful. So pretty much I think everyone's here. So that's incredible. Okay. So um, yeah, I mean, look at this uh, really briefly. Oops, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, Maggie Hambling, uh, this is actually, it's Trump. I thought it was a photo of uh, a portrait of uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, this is the portraits that we talked about uh, or that I mentioned that I uh, absolutely love. I love her and I love the portraits and it's a way of uh, documenting, you know, as artists, we have so many advantages, I feel. Um, and we can be witness, we can express ourselves and um, I don't know, we can document. Um, so yeah, this is a self portrait of her and it's an incredible, incredible um, painting. And if you've never heard of her, I know that people in the UK have, but if you've never heard of uh, Maggie Hambling before, add her to your um, list, to your radar, to your, cause she's still alive and she is, fantastic and awesome and I love her work so uh, yeah David Park uh, this is the example or the artist that we talked about that Celeste uh, loves and discovered yeah so a Bay Area painter uh, the figurative Bay Area period I guess um, was fascinating and incredible I mean, I love his paintings and he uh, wasn't as recognized as he is right now. And, but yeah, yep, that's it. Yeah, the electric fountain. Uh, I didn't know the name of the sculpture, but that's the, the Tonga uh, praying. So he's, I think he's praying, uh, but yeah, that's an incredible. This is, and all the uh, iconography here is basically uh, featuring uh, things that the tribe did and created and crafts and traditions and customs um, all around it and also in the tiles around. They recently renovated and it's a beautiful space. The tiles around the sculpture uh, or the fountain also feature different scenes from uh, traditional uh, Tonga you know, life. It's pretty remarkable. It's pretty remarkable. It's incredible that it's that it's there. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's incredible. And this is a uh, sketch by... That's by Hania. Oh, Hania, yes. Okay, perfect. Love Hania. Hania, how are you? I hope you are enjoying uh, our time uh, together. Um, so I'm glad that you jumped in. I was really excited when we, when I saw your, um, yeah, your name. So great, great sketch. I love the fact that you prepped the work. Um, are you here, Hania, by any, by any chance? Cause I want to make sure that I take, um, the opportunity to get a feedback, uh, for people that are actually here. I know that it's very late in the UK right now, and probably you're not. It shows that she's on, um, okay. that she's watching. So at least we can. Okay. Talk yeah. To so her. let yeah. me just uh, see if there's another image. Uh, it's only the sketch, right? Yeah. I think it's only the sketch. Okay. Yeah. Well, honey, a great sketch as usual. Um, I love the, um, the charcoal. And I, as always, my favorite part is that you take your time to do the process and your paintings always. Uh, you know, come out incredible. Um, so yeah, beautiful composition in regards to what I see in the sketch at this stage, great composition. 
you left uh, enough space, but it's a little tight. Uh, it's a little tight, and it almost looks like the hair. The hair it's very flat, and that area. So careful compositionally because it may be a tad too much to the top. Um, just an observation. Yeah, you trust your expertise and uh, experience. But yeah, compositionally, when I look at it um, right now, I feel like compositionally it's something that you may want to consider. It's, it's, it's a little bit of space, but it's really high up. Um, anyhow, so uh, before we go to Dina, yeah, I'm going to find the image. I think it's in Carson. Yeah. Uh, Elijah. Oh, wow. Interesting, Jan. Did you, you found some information, right, in the article? Yeah, it was really cool. I didn't have time to read the whole thing, but it was really sweet. It's from the perspective of um, one of the men that started the company, and it's talking about how proud they are that this is just as well known. This image is just as well known as like the in and out sign, <laughs> and it's been around longer. So it was really sweet. Like I said, I didn't have time to, to read it all, but um, but yeah, I think it's worth reading. We should go paint there. I mean, I don't know. This image is pretty... <laughs> <laughs> But I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of them all. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, so yeah, and then this is our postcard, basically the David uh Beethoven. Uh very interesting. That's one of the most classic sculptures of monuments that we have in LA, possibly. Uh and yeah interesting it would be fine it would be great to find out oh maybe you did uh to find out uh the context and why it was moved there or if it was meant to be there all along um yeah so basically uh dina um thanks for the setup i love that you were able to put the two screens side by side so that's great and you were able to print the photo how about that that's pretty amazing um, and I know that you posted an image, uh, before, I mean, after, um, yeah, right here. So perfect. And I put, I already put this one before. Um, so excellent. Amazing. Okay. So this is a very fun, um, image because, uh, from the perspective of someone who doesn't know, um, what this is coming from, it's interesting to find um this subject in a painting i would say so to me love the color palette uh i love the composition um and i almost feel like the image tells me um is the statue going up or going down there's something about that that i actually like <laughs> uh well, I, there... I, I thought you know the picture has the um the supporting strap around his waist and um I was going to actually maybe put it around his neck. So then that way you could tell that you're pretty much removing it as opposed <laughs> to putting it back. But I don't know. Maybe I should just leave it the way it is. Well, that's a, basically a personal artistic decision. I think um, it works without it right now, but I see the photo and I understand that it would be really cool um, to I'll add. Probably, I'll probably just leave it um around his waist as as the picture is because if you if you were to i was going to do the other thing but i thought if you're going to post it uh it'd probably be better if i stuck to his waist yeah i mean there you bring up such an amazing point because this is what this is what i mentioned about you know the uh, artists having to deal with both things, freedom of expression and censorship in a way, or self-censorship, because this is precisely what this is all about. We have to consider it, we, how are these images going to be used when they're posted or shared. Um, so it's an interesting conversation, I think, but it's, it's totally uh, up to your creative, um, you know, decision. It's a, it's a personal creative decision. I think in, in re strictly in regards of the the painting, it's not something that I, I would say should take over the rest. Although I love the fact that uh, it's the brightest accent color. So there's something right. there that I really like. Right. Um, I think and you probably will consider this, um, but I think I would just bring more uh, illusion of 
inform on the crane. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I I'm not finished. That, but yeah, you're right. I just wanted to to plant Simon. Right. Yeah. I mean so the the angle. Yeah, the underneath of the crane or the the curvature or the planes the planes of the crane the planes of the crane yeah <laughs> and i also like the wires there's something uh, uh, i love about that industrial element i yeah. mean it, it works the way it is right now i think the color palette is great but and i love um the pedestal or the plinth is it called plinth or i don't know yeah I don't know. something like that um I did have a question though because I have my blues, you know that that that's like a turquoise blue, yeah. and I have the only blues I have I have that, that yeah the Payne's gray and then I have that um, the ultramarine blue and then I have where is the regular I have oh oh I have ultramarine I have ultramarine blue. And I got ultramarine blue again. Well, I got it in open color too. So those are the two, only two colors. So how would I get it closest to that? I would just maybe use the turquoise that you have, actually. I don't have turquoise. I mean, oh, I, don't... I thought you said you had turquoise. Uh, no, no, no. I want to know how I could match that color when I only have the um, Payne's gray and the ultramarine blue. So the only thing is ultramarine and white. And okay. it's not going to give you that cobalt um, hue. Right, that, right. That's... Okay. Yeah, because it's going to be a, re a colder blue. Right. Um, but yeah, if you want to try to add a little bit of green, a tiny, tiny bit of green there, tiny. Maybe. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll experiment. Yeah. Yeah. But basically, that's, that's what I would do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, Chloe, uh, are you? Yeah. Did you use, um, you used the um, digital version. Yeah, you painted on the tablet, right? Yeah. So if you are there. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that looks amazing and fantastic and incredible. And um, which software did you use? Uh, Procreate. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, it's brilliant. And I love the fact that you use digital media, by the way. So... Yeah, there is something really cool about uh, the way you painted the crowd. I think that's all you needed uh, because otherwise it would have been too uh, alike. So, and then you get rid of some of the crowd right here. Um, oops, sorry. So, um, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I love the phone. So I think that's great. It's done. And I like the rusty colors on the figure as well. So that's something really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. It looks amazing. It's, it's very... not as enjoyable as painting, but it's um, the next best thing. Yes. And you know what? I completely support it because um, I think it's important. It just engages you. Um, and I think it's really good. So um, well done. You know, it's just a great image. It's a great image. And I love the way you uh, rendered it. I think it's really good. I like the stone as well. So there's a lot of texture on your image and I think you did it in a really nice way. So um, oh, thanks. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, use it more. I mean, I, I love this medium as well. So um, I love less medium. clean, less cleaning up today. Less cleaning yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For Jen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thought <Right>. it, Jen. <laughs> thanks, <Tommy. laughs> it Thank you. Great. It looks great. Well done. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Fantastic. I wouldn't say anything else. Yeah, I mean, if you had time, I would just now do a study, maybe with pencil or something. It'd be nice to sort of like, since you have the experience of doing this uh, digitally, maybe just do a quick sketch or something, even if it's just with pencil, just to give you a different take on it. Because I think that would just help you as well to bring it full circle. And uh, so I'm going to move the, uh, to the next one. And this was, someone chose this one. I forgot who that I think was. it's Sarah Jennings. Oh, Sarah Jennings. Wow. Yeah. This, um, so um, I love the colors of this image. Oh, and you just like change from horizontal to vertical. Wow. Well done. Yeah. Nicely done. Um, 
different. I would have kind of like imagined this on a landscape orientation, but I think it's a good idea to change the orientation. This is a gorgeous painting, gorgeous painting. Um, uh, I feel like, you know, aesthetically, it's uh, really great. There's something uh, very uh, intriguing and mysterious. Um, I love the color palette. I like the vanishing points. Uh, I love the use of the dark. I like the hand and the shadow. Um, so uh, really strong. If you had more time, um, I would just work on the image of the figure because I feel like uh, the, the statue is great that it's um, more detail, but I feel like that this is um, very stark. You know, there's uh, something about the high contrast between the legs or the pants and the background that I feel it's too much on the spotlight. I know that it should be there, uh, but I feel there's less contrast here. So consider bringing less contrast. So this really pops up. You won't get rid of the figure because it's important to have someone standing right next to it. Conceptually, I think it just makes sense. But um, I feel um, it, you would just uh, sort of like integrate the figure with the space in a better way because I feel like now it's very much cut and paste in my opinion in this uh, area. But this looks excellent. I love this painting. I love what I like what you did with it. I think it's really great. I'm just gonna do a refresh and see what else we've got. Uh, okay. Oh, Feral, this is amazing. I think this is the, you only upload it uh, to, yeah. Uh, Feral, this is just incredible and um, amazing. And I love, uh, did you use kind of like watercolor? Farrell? Yeah, I had to use watercolor because of a whole various, a whole bunch of reasons. And so it was, I know, you know, the process is, is different and it's limiting in certain ways. And actually, I ultimately really wanted, you know, the, the original image is very colorless uh, and I wanted to keep, you know, the foreground being really strong, but I really ultimately would like to add more color into it because I feel right. like I would just like to do that. Yeah. Um, and I also decided that this guy with his arms raised, he almost could look like a white, you know, uh, you know, what do you call those, uh, white extremist sort of. So I decided to make him black. Um, and oh. it changed. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> good. So it would be a little more kind of clear. And also there's an, in the original, uh, which I didn't put in yet, um, there's that, see that uh, yellow rope that's in the street? Right, yeah. And I think that that's probably what they, what pulled it down. And, you know, so I do, will eventually add something like that someplace. Great. Great. Well, I can tell you that I absolutely love um, the the main figure for me, the topple uh, statue. There's something really great about the way you created volume by bringing this perspective on the platform, really. And then also it's clear, you don't need much detail here because it's clear that this is a statue. It's clear that it's facing down. So with the strokes that you have already in place, um, the hand, you know, the sleeves. I feel like everything's pretty clear. In that sense, to me, that's the most, um, oh, good. Um, you know, successful, I guess, part of the painting. And I love the fact that you just brought the cast shadow. So that's important as well, the light direction. I like the architectural element here being sort of like penciled and drawn and not necessarily kind of like painted. It's important because it just gives a sense of this being outdoors but it doesn't have to be uh, super colored or super detailed. So to me, that kind of like works really well. And I agree with you. I would probably um, sort of like work on this figure a little further because I, I just feel like, you know, uh, maybe a little bit more detail. I think it's important to develop it a little bit further just so it brings um, more uh, importance to the narrative, I guess. So yeah. um, I like this one recording. So I think this is also very important conceptually. Uh, the fact, and it just connects with the image that you did um, your first painting, basically, because it was important for you to uh, represent people that were recording what was going to happen, what was happening. Yeah. So in that sense, they're, they're very well connected. I mean, if you intend to work on this, which you said that you, you would, yeah. I, I would, I would definitely kind of like work 
um, I know that you're gonna probably add more work to the sculpture, but I would work on the background a little bit more, so. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to figure what to do with the kind of street versus the sidewalk. Um, again, I, I, in the original, it's, it's just kind of pale and washed out, and I just wanted the painting to be a little more lively color-wise, and uh, just, just because um, when I chose it, I really loved the I loved the the harsh thing of the sculpture uh, mm -hmm. on the ground, and I loved that guy raising, and I loved the camera guy. But what I didn't love about it was it was just kind of almost monochromatic, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to enliven it a little bit. Right. Good. Well, I think if anything, um, so I think what stands out, like uh, apart from like um, uh, the monochromatic aspect, uh, are two things that you should consider when you continue uh, the work. One is that you know you have the sidewalk and you have the vanishing, the vanishing line that kind of like goes on this direction. Um, yeah. But then you have a vanishing line as well that groups the trees. So I feel like on yours, I would just kind of like you did it basically, but I would just kind of like consider that um, as a companion of this line because I think both of them together it will give you a stronger sense of depth. Um, yeah. And at the same time, I just feel like the high contrast between the trees and the sky sort of like delineates the trees a little bit more. And I feel like this is the same value on both sides. Mm -hmm. So I would probably use more color, but paler um, on the outside and maybe more color, but um, uh, darker on the trees. So you get that separation between the trees and the background. Um, mm -hmm that I feel it's going to help you just convey a sense of uh, much, much more depth. Uh, so. Cool. I don't know. I think, you know, based on the work that I saw from you, um, the very first uh, sort of like sketch and then the amazing painting afterward, uh, no pressure, but I can wait to see what you do with this one. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Farrell. Um, and oh, Sarah nuts <laughs> absolutely nuts um okay so i amazing you know uh, this is just uh really good I, really good i would uh, let me see if i can bring oh you have another one here so i'm gonna briefly i'm gonna just bring this forward and then i'll just organize them hold on one second i'll organize them and i'll put them all oops yeah next to each other um because i think this is important so uh one second i'll just bring this right here and then i'll bring the actual image which i have uh above i think yeah perfect so all right here we go so um there you go. So yeah, so you had this image and then uh, I had this image right here and then this one. I think you added some texture. Yeah, you added some texture. Um, you're basically, I think it's done. I mean, it's just an incredible uh, painting in its simplicity. Um, it's just very interesting. Uh, it's strange also. This is something um, that it's remarkable in the painting. It's the fact that it's a decapitated head. So it's a gruesome subject, but the way it's painted, it, it's so um, enchanting and romantic. I like that completely clash between subject and language. And it's something that's very effective in painting uh, when trying to depict something um, that shows uh, violence. Uh, you know, playing with language and subject, uh, I find it interesting. This is an example for me. And there's a component of like a surrealism in the painting as well that I really like. Um, looking at the image, um, I would say, I know that the, this is nighttime and there are a lot of uh, lights here. No, never mind. I was going to say something about that because there's something about the section of the head and then the shadows but I find that this is part of the beauty of the painting I wouldn't try to make anything clear or change anything about it um, so let me see the cone I mean this is up to you I feel like the cone here reads more of like a uh, like a like a pyramid 
Mm -hmm. um, and then this is more sort of like a, like a cone, like a round cone. It's silly. My observation is totally silly because it doesn't make any difference. Doesn't really, doesn't really make any difference. If you wanted to blend maybe a little bit more, okay. Um, but it doesn't make a difference. Maybe the top could be a little bit softened. I think the top is very, um, a little bit softer because you can see a little bit of the top, uh, the surface um, above the cone. And I feel this is very much cut. Okay. So if anything, I would just soften, oops, I would soften that, um, that area. Um, and in regards of the distinction between uh, the cone and uh, uh, the sculpture. So I almost feel I would do something with this edge. I almost feel like sometimes, you know, this is the edge of the cone. It's not the darkest part of the cone. The darkest part of the cone is a little bit, it's on the number, on the, on the number. Yeah. So I would probably apply that as well here because I feel like you brought the value all the way to the edge mm -hmm. and it creates um, a hard line. The line is very hard, but I feel like it's not the darkest part. So I would leave the darkest part uh, um, away um, from that edge. Okay. These are all like minimal things. I'm trying to nitpick because, you know, the painting is really incredible. Maybe, um, yeah, never mind. There's nothing about it. I'm looking at things like I, I, I would look at in other uh, contexts, you know, the point of contact, for example, of the um, of the head on um, of the ground, and I feel like it's really great. You could possibly, on the point of contact, maybe shave it a little bit more, so you create more of a sculptural. Because I feel like this expands, so you could just bring a little bit more of the cheekbone and a little bit. Um, uh, shaving it in, uh, shaving it a little bit. Okay. Maybe. I mean, that's again silly. It's an extraordinary painting. Thank you. Yeah, extraordinary. You should be really proud. It's really, it's really cool. It's a cool painting. Um, it's interesting and intriguing, and and you have the layer of the historical context that's adding it so much more to it. So. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, Laura, um, amazing, amazing. I was so moved when you uh, chose this image, you know. <laughs> oh, are you there, Laura? Yes, I am. Okay. So, Why were you moved? I don't know, because there's something... Yeah, there is something more powerful, more personal to me of you choosing this image. Let's just yes, put it this way. Definitely. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I didn't even know why I asked why, but, but uh, yes, it's exactly right, Julio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that's some power right there. It's some power. So, yeah, anyhow. And then the image is pretty strong because, you know, it, it, it's using red paint to depict blood because... You know, some of the images were taken down and some were uh, kind of like splashed with red paint. So this reminds me, um, Laura, there was uh, an exhibit at the LAGMA a few years ago. And um, it was an exhibit of art uh, that was done by uh, Native Americans. No, mm. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It was an exhibit done, um, art, religious art, uh, trying to represent Native Americans. So oh. um, it wasn't, yeah. So it was a bold, interesting, fascinating look. It, it, was, uh, it was the way a museum should tackle this, um, this thing, basically. A, a museum uh, uh, talking about narrative and language and history all together. It was really... Uh, educational but there was an image that's that... pretty interesting because... tell me no that, that's a bit pretty interesting from a museum because usually they don't really like to uh, make a bias they don't really like to make a strong opinion am I right right they just like to present everything but um, sometimes it's kind of hard to expose I guess 
you know, that right. has been underlying. It, it, yeah. I mean, they could have gone like more political, obviously, but it was pretty clear. It was pretty clear by this, the, the context. It was just pretty clear that uh, art was used as a conversion tool at that time. So it, the art, it wasn't just an expression of feelings. It was a form wow. of oppression religious oppression and you know conversion and all that stuff so it was pretty clear it was good because for the first time it was an exhibit that uh, basically wasn't trying to uh create the idea that religious art was wonderful you know it was depicting the role of religious art during that dark time in history in american history yeah and it's still very prevalent like in mexico when you go to the old beautiful churches you still see that beautiful i mean it is beautiful but with that commentary behind it or with that narrative it's uh wow it's a whole different way to look at it you know unfortunately yeah, yeah. but yeah. people people even today they're very they follow they follow and they to them it's like like the, those paintings were like the real thing you know what i mean like they yeah. were the bible Right. I, on a personal note for everyone, not just for you, Laura, the first time that in my mind, all these things came in the first time, long time ago, it was the first time that I uh, visited Mexico uh, a long time ago. Never before I realized the context of things. Never before, never before. Cause you know, growing up, you always kind of like, that's, you assume things and you never think of anything. But only when I went to Mexico and I went to Mexico City and I saw the cathedral and I saw the remains of the Aztec, uh, the Mayan temple. <laughs> oh, yeah, the Aztec, the Aztec temple. Aztec, yeah, yes. built, I mean, destroyed and destroyed just to build the cathedral. They destroyed that monument just to, be, then you're like, whoa. <laughs> and they built on top of it. On top of it. Yeah. And yeah. Then, they still excavate and find. Yeah. Yes. 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 So then I was like, okay. <laughs> right. That's a story that we were never told as kids in Spain. We were never told as kids. So I yeah. think it's a wonderful time now to tell the, the history, not only, of course, Latin America, the indigenous people of America, right. and also obviously the African American, uh, you know, uh, experience. Right. There's so much, so many people that are coming to the forefront and basically demanding that yeah. this history be told in schools, you know? That's yeah. so important. I, this is important times. Yeah. Yeah, Laura. Yeah, no, anyhow, yes, I agree with you. This reminds me of, <laughs> of a figure. Yeah, it was a figure of um, a dramatic, I'll be as brief as I can, a figure of a boy uh, with... Uh, with uh, wearing what uh, I, my guess is what people wore, you know, native people wore. Indigenous, then, like indigenous. Indigenous, uh -huh. yeah. So, and then, but this was done by a Spanish artist, okay? So it was a boy and then on one hand, it had an avocado, uh, a half an, a half avocado. I will always remember this image. On the other hand, it had the heart of, you know, the Jesus Christ, whatever, the bloody sort of like heart. So wow. the image was meant for children to show children they had to choose. They had to choose. <laughs> wow. Between, you know, whatever, you know, avocado representing their culture and then religion uh, representing the represented by the heart. It was That's so awful. Powering. So That's heartbreaking. <laughs> heartbreaking. I'm saying this because the position of this um, uh, sculpture, it's exactly the same as the boy, Laura. Oh, wow. Yeah. Two hands, just like that. And then um, th it reminds me of that sculpture so much. Um, anyhow. That's <laughs> deep, Julio. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say that Juan Diego uh, uh, image, just because to me, I'm so torn with that image because it's clearly to you know manipulate but yet there's so much study on the Virgen de Guadalupe that scientists say that it's you know the real thing and so many people are so devout my mother and you know I love the image and it's a beautiful thing and I would I would pray to it 
but I mean, you know what I mean? Do yeah, we, yeah. is it, it's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's the same thing, yeah. Yeah. It's listen. so weird that nobody, nobody dispels that. Everybody says, no, there is scientific uh, backing that it's a miracle because the, the paint is not from that century is, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We need a, a, a 24 hour Zoom for all those things. <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry. This is the no, 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 no. No, it's true. It's true. But that's, yeah, that's, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. Laura, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to. But um, yes, to recap, it's been more than 500 years and it's still current. It's still current and uh, your image is beautiful the painting is uh, remarkable amazing thank you for uh this time checking uh compositionally giving more space above the head it helps a lot <laughs> love the palm trees they're exquisite and stunning visually powerful love the green that you use um it's the way you have it right now it's more developed than you usually have at this stage so to me this looks okay. spectacular um if you want to work a little bit more i i just I can't wait to see what it looks like basically but um it's a very strong beautifully rendered um image um again what i mentioned to sarah brochure language and concept you know i love tackling hard uh, subjects with soft language. There's something even more powerful to me. So um, this works, I don't know. Wow, that's beautifully put, Julio. Thank you. It, it, uh, uh, thank you for uh, identifying it the way you did. It, it just even brings, it has a lot more weight for me now emotionally. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like I want to go cry right now. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I take this as a beautiful thing, Laura. <laughs> um, and as a compliment. Yeah, it's so it's so good that we do this. It's so good that we do this and that you're yes. here doing it, Laura. And that you're here doing it. I'm so happy. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And the work is everybody's work is amazing. And yeah. um and uh Chloe just gave us another tool, like we need more tools. <laughs> right, yeah. I want to yeah. play with that. That's crazy. I know, I, I know. It. No, it's good. Yeah, we should we should explore it more because I think it's a good it's a good tool, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um let me just go back. Yes, Darlene. I mean, this image. Come on. So this is the same um uh, Christopher Columbus in Boston. Uh, it's the same sculpture. I love the fact that um, Sarah Brocher uh, chose the head and then you chose the, <laughs> the bust, the headless bust. So there's something really powerful. It's a very charged image, obviously, very charged. And, and um, as charged as what Laura chose, in my opinion, in a different way. And I am, I have chills just to think of how amazing uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, and how beautiful uh, this is turning out. I mean, uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm not able to put words together, but basically let's just go to your painting. Um, great, um, I would say great composition. Uh, yeah, because the mask kind of like goes all the way uh, to the top. Yeah, I think so. I think, okay, so when I look at an image um, the way it is right now, the first thing that I look at is compositionally, uh, just because I feel like it's the fundament or the foundation, rather, of uh, the whole thing. And since we started with the sketch, my eye goes there. Um, so I think compositionally you left enough space on both sides um, of the figure and then on top. I like it. Uh, I like the way it is. I like it a lot. So to me, um, and I, I, I just love the fact that you chose this because you can really concentrate on the sculpture and the flag and not having to worry about uh, the background. So very smart and, and really good idea. I was actually worried about the background because it's just so, there doesn't seem to be any shade or it. it's just right. the same. Yeah, no, I think it's an advantage for you because uh, you could treat it very neutral. There are no architectural elements, no botanical elements. So that's out of the picture. And I think that's an advantage. 
But at the same time, it means that you will have to treat the figure mm -hmm. and the flag differently with more detail. Yeah. So in that sense, I would say the first thing that I would do, I mean, obviously, um, maybe not the first thing, but it's important to distinct two things here. The fact that the figure is um, sharp, it's uh, within the uh, depth of field. Uh, so we see the figure like in a sharp uh, kind of like way. Uh, and I think that's something that I would develop. And then the flag, it's out of like um, the depth of field. So it's unfocused. Um, I think narratively, it's also uh, very cool that you have this opportunity because what I would do is to blur uh, more the flag. I just feel like that um, would just make, sh it, would, it would still be the American flag. It would still be uh, the symbol and representative of everything, but um, diffusing it or making it unfocused, I think conceptually will work uh, also very well because you will make a distinction between both elements, which I think it's important as well, um, because otherwise the mast and the shoulder kind of like align. And that's something that um, they align. They, they don't align as much here. I would possibly work more on darkening this area of the sculpture because um, you have like more contrast between the sculpture and the background. If you notice the light, the outdoor light, it's coming from behind uh, the sculpture. So uh, it's basically backlit. So in that sense, I would darken more the sculpture and create uh, highlights um, on this area of the of the uh, of the figure. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I wasn't. I mean, I wanted to make sure I could have it even look like a flag, <laughs> but now yeah. I can. I can. Um, I'll have no trouble putting it into a softer focus. I'm more worried about the. Um, the, jet, the statue itself. Right, so in the statue to me, the key is the light, um, the light, Darlene. So the light direction. So the light direction uh, is, it's backlit. So have that in mind because what you'll have to do is create more shadow work um, all over, especially like more detail with the, with the darker shadows on the, arm, uh, on the armpit and then uh, on the color but mostly it's much darker on the figure because that's gonna, this is as light as the background. So right. I think that will sculpt the figure by itself. So that's the only thing that I would- uh, I, sort of I was like, a little concerned about how did the, the um, paint, the, the colors I should be using. Uh, I would say, I like that you used uh, the blue because it's, there's a lot of coolness so you need to use like that blue for sure. But I would say, um, yeah, I would, uh, Ecru, because it's a little warm. Uh, I wouldn't use at all, uh, uh, burnt sienna at all. Um, so maybe um, raw umber and gray um, and blue, raw umber and gray and blue, because it's still cool. It's still cool, but it's darker. It's darker. That helps a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, okay. I just can't wait. This is such a powerful, beautiful, uh, meaningful image. Uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled that you chose this. Well done. It's going to be an amazing painting, Darlene. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, we have to, we have to. This is just too, it's just too good. Yeah. This is just too good. Lois, this is just amazing. Incredible, um, really incredible image. Uh, I think that was uh, Columbus in Minnesota. Um, I just love everything about this, uh, this photo. The fact that uh, the people are the ones that are lit actually, but also playing with uh, focus on the, yeah. uh, on the sculpture that's and then focus on the crowd. So that's important as well. Yeah, that's what appealed to me. Oh, gorgeous, the way you resolve the crowd, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. I, I think it's just, you brought color and uh, I like the pixelation. I think it's really great. I feel like on the sculpture, I feel like there still needs to be more of a point of contact. Yes. Um, yes, I'm, the shadow, it's very, that shadow is very, very tricky. Yeah, yeah, because you have so there's, much. There's lights and darks inside the shadow. Right, yeah. So 
you know, once you put that shadow in, it was kind of hard to pull some of those lights back. Right. I'll have right. to do that. I don't yeah. know. I don't want the treatment of the sculpture to be the same as the crowd. So I'm, I'm kind of like it just a really dark. Yeah. Shape. Or I can make it very soft and realistic. I'm not sure, you know, like I, I, I'm kind of not sure how to, how to do it, but I kind of like this big black monolith right. thing broken, you know, down on the ground, but. I think so. I would just, uh, I think conceptually that's important because it's not just about rendering the exactness of the sculpture, but. Yeah, exactly. I feel like now I need to put the picture away almost and just focus on how the painting looks and resolve right. all the problems within the painting. Yeah. I mean, you have, I, I would even bring more dark notes on the, on the, on the sculpture even. I mean, if you wanted to concentrate more darks, well, you know. Dark, keep going dark. I'm kind of dark already, but I could keep going darker and darker. <laughs> something, I think there's something interesting. I just feel like, you know, the way you have it, it's great. And I agree with you 100% that it wouldn't need to be uh, treated. Uh, in fact, I would just spend more time with the crowd. You know, I think that's really cool. I mean, if you wanted to, there's something really interesting about the people behind. Um, yeah, just the shadow, you know, it just depends how much time and how far you want to take it. You have it in a very, very sweet spot. Uh, just very few details that I would work basically on the shadow. And then I would say, um, uh, see it almost as a, as, as seeing a menu, you know, an, an art read, an artistic decision main menu, you know, do you want to make a sculpture? Art. <laughs> yeah. The, you choose on the menu what you want to take forward, but, at this stage, you know, it's just really, really cool. You know, it's really cool. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I think it, once I, once I, maybe once I conquer the shadow, hopefully what to do next will reveal itself. Yeah, such a great image, Lois. Such a great image. So cool. That was, um, yeah, hard to tackle, but. Hard to tackle, yeah. You challenge because... us every week, Julio. It's so oh. good. <laughs> Everybody's paintings are amazing. And the, amazing. This is. great. Very, I mean, very good for today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I, I my expectations, um, you know, this, um, what's the word, Jen? This kind of like uh, upstaged my expectations. <laughs> um, Denise, I don't know if you're there or not, but this is exquisite. Exquisite. There's something super uh, strong about it and at the same time dark um yeah this is a really, a really interesting image you know we're not gonna go uh we're not gonna this is a less known figure it's a less known figure in history i mean less known for us obviously but in belgium it's it's pretty well known um but i just love that you chose it because there's something uh cool about it the the palette for me comes first your palette it's it's fantastic uh i find remarkable the way you treated the stains because this could have easily been um uh using red and uh as a way of vandalizing it but you use red um in a very um uh, integrating way and it works beautifully i think it works beautifully um i think i understand that compositionally you had very little space up there and it's fine. I'm not even worried about the little tiny space up there, but um, yeah, something to um, consider in the sense of like giving more space. No, never mind. Yeah, it just works. To me, it just works. Um, so I would probably bring highlights on this figure if you wanted to work on it only. I mean, I um, uh, remember the painting that you did of the, uh, the, one of the paintings or reproduction um, hanging from the house and you took that painting <laughs> to the next level. Your work at the beginning was great, but then what you did with it was better than the original Cezanne, if you ask me. Incredible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if I think this painting is worth exploring a little bit more. You have it in a very good spot. This stands on its own as a study. If you just want to leave it like that, um, it, it stands on its own, 
but I feel like if you were interested in doing more and we can, because we, we have um, photographs, which allows us to do it like at different times of the day, I would say just bringing some highlights because there's something dramatic about the light. The fact mm -hmm. that the recessed eyes um, are capturing more kind of like shadows. And I feel um, on the forehead, on the nose, I would just bring more highlights here and then darken the shadows on the eye just because there's something um, uh, scary and almost aggressive about that look. So, and I would explore, I would explore that with light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me? so that would <laughs> basically, to me, that would be it. Just kind of like bring some highlights to the figure. And then I like the background. I think the background is great. It's, it's kind of like abstraction. Um, I would just possibly continue and just fill it up if you wanted to. Um, but I like the way you treated it. I like the darkness. I wouldn't change a thing about the background, except for uh, maybe just working on adding more darks. Um, but there's no transition. It's pretty flat. Uh, there's no highs and lows. So there's this area that's pretty um, even, and then you have the splash. There's something cool about connecting that splash with the bust, and you did it. So I think, um, yeah, I just think that works. Maybe just even making uh, the harder edges of that splash a little bit more defined. Because right now it doesn't read, it reads like something that's smeared on the background as well. But I feel like if you were to sharpen, you don't have to do every single drop, obviously, but if you sharpened a little bit that splash and brought more contrast, um, I think that would just help the narrative and uh, the overall painting. What do you think? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Oh, now I can hear you. Okay, sorry, my thing was a little weird. Yeah, thanks. I um, they, they, that's that's great. All the all of those um, uh, comments are great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I want. I, I'm kind of in the dark phase. I need to bring it into the light. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's an amazing painting. It's an yeah. amazing painting. So thank you. I love well. that image. Well Very done. Cool. Yeah. It's kind of gross though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but it's cool. I love that we're, we're dealing with it. So I think it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. It's good to look at the picture actually of the, you know, the painting and then go back to it. After. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I actually think I was thinking the red looks really fake, but I actually kind of like it with the photo. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I think it's a great way to, of integrating it because you know, you have to be, um, if you bring pure red here, then it's just going to be a different painting. It's just going to yeah, be I need a little, a little pink because that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. A little yeah. orangey actually. Yeah. Yeah. It works. Great. Well, thanks. It I'm going to go, go back. I'm, I'm playing hooky from work. So I have to go back now. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. Yeah. No, I'm so happy that you're here. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Awesome. Bye bye. So and in, in that way, in that, um, let me see, I'm just gonna, yeah. So, oops. Uh, okay, now. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, sorry. So in that sense, okay, good. Yeah. And oh, I didn't put the spotlight here. So anyhow, sorry. So thank you so much. Uh, Jen, any questions that you said there were that you, I should uh, add? before we wrap it up? Um, yes, yeah, so I, we can either address this now or on Tuesday, but um, we had a question about, um, like, like Laura said, about the digital medium and kind of how to use it like Chloe did. So maybe that's something we can discuss on Tuesday. Okay. Um, yeah, adding a little, a another tool in our tool belt. Yeah. And then we had a question from Sarah Brochure. Um, I run into this problem all the time, but, um, she has trouble sometimes with um, some of the oil tubes get really oily and separated in the um, oh. in the tube, and then some are really dry and hard to squeeze out, and some are completely normal. Is there any way to avoid this, or does temperature have something to do with it? I find that when we're out in the sun, they tend to get oilier, oilier, and sometimes I just have to massage them. But, um, yeah, we can talk about it on Tuesday, but um, 
it just it, it depends on the quality of the paint really because you know i think gambling is a really excellent quality but some of the colors when we buy them brand new they have that um i think mostly when the oil comes out then we don't have to deal with that anymore so it's usually at the very beginning of the tube right. but do you find that as well with uh i i feel like for me it's when i open a brand new tube and then i squeeze it um, right which is tricky because if you squeeze out all the oil, if it's separated and you squeeze it all right. out, it's really, you know, not good for the rest of the Right. Paint. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, with, with student grade oils, it happens all the time and it's terrible. It's just, right. it, it's, it's the quality of the paint and it's not really well blended, you know, um, with gambling, uh, you know, sometimes it happens, even if it's not new, I have to say it happens, you know, with the paint's gray and stuff, it could happen. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. And unless we sort of like close the tube and then we, uh, yeah, we squeeze it backward, I guess. Uh, right. But it's so hard to blend it. It's not, yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's... But it's interesting. I'll, I'll just, uh, let's search uh, more um, research more about it. And then on Tuesday, we can just see if we can have more information. But yeah, I've right. never found um, any tips or advice for that. It's basically the quality of the paint. It's the yeah. quality of the, the paint. And I mean, gambling is professional, but it's not considered high end. So I wonder mm -hmm. if other, what I'm going to try to find out is if other brands that are more high end, they have the same issue because then then we can attribute it to the quality of the paint. Um, but otherwise, yeah. Cool. That's it. Just that and the digital medium. Um, okay. Yeah. So we're good. Tuesday. Awesome. So thanks, Jen, and thanks Thank everyone. You guys. Yeah. Thanks for. We'll bring some more images and bye, Lois. Bye. 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 Bye, Dina. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are the best. You, you are truly amazing, all of you. So this yeah. was... Our fearless um, leader. Thank you. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Tuesday. Oh, no, this was so, as usual, uh, this was so good. This was so good. It was so good to do this together. So really appreciative. That's you breaking. Oh, yes. So anyhow. Thank you. This was amazing. And you guys are incredible people. We love you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Julia. Bye, everybody. Bye. Everybody. Thank Bye. You. Have a good weekend. Bye, everyone. Happy weekend. Yeah.